All right, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the East Coast Combinatorics Conference uh, at the University of Prince Edward Island. So I'd like to thank everyone for coming. It's been uh, three years since our last ECCC, and uh, you know, for many, it might be the first in-person <laughs> conference experience in the last couple of years, so it's great to, to see everyone here. Um, we are live streaming in addition to our uh, in-person uh, colleagues here. Um, so I will, uh, for the people who are joining the stream, I will point out that there is a chat feature um, that you should be able to find on the left-hand side of your screen, or no, the right-hand side of your screen, I believe. Um, so if you do have a question that you would like to contribute at the end of any of our talks, um, we'll monitor that chat and uh, hopefully uh, be able to deliver those questions and, and we have participation from both in-person and online participants. Um, so I would like to welcome our, our first speaker uh, of the conference, um, Dr. Brett Stevens. Um, Brett was educated at the University of Chicago, the University College London, and the University of Toronto. His MSc was in Mathematical Biology and his PhD in Mathematics, specifically in Combinatorics. Uh, he did postdoctoral work at Simon Fraser University and IBM TJ Watson Laboratories. He's interested in Combinatorics with a focus on design theory and orderings of combinatorial objects. He enjoys thinking about the interaction of mathematics with other disciplines and culture. He is Professor of Mathematics at Carleton University. Uh, and this morning, Brett will be talking to us about mutually orthog oh, I knew <laughs> orth orthogoval. I practiced that ahead of time and I still <laughs> messed it up. <laughs> I say orthogoval. Orthogoval. There we because go. Because I put a dash in, but my, my colleagues told me to take the dash out. So now, how do you pronounce it? So. Orthogoval. <laughs> okay, mutual orthogoval, or orthogoval, whichever you prefer, projective and affine planes. And uh, welcome, Brett. Oh, thanks so much, Shannon. <laughs> well, it's really, this is my first live conference since, you know, it all happened. I was supposed to go live to a conference in June at the Fields Engine in Toronto, but I caught COVID two days before the conference. So um, this is now my first, and I'm very happy to be here. I had dinner with colleagues last night. Oh, my gosh. It's been so long. It's so nice. Okay. Um, and thanks for the introduction, and thanks for the invitation. So um, I just want to explain that the uh, dimensions of my screen and the dimensions of that screen are not identical. So my stylus is, for some reason, calibrated to that screen. So. I may miss buttons occasionally and have to like go like <coughs> find my way. So please excuse me when that happens. Okay, yeah. So I want to talk about this um, these orthogoval um, or or orthogoval um, projective and affine planes. But I want to give you a little bit of a teaser. Um, to something that's going to show up later in the talk and is the reason that I got interested in this topic and made me learn a lot of geometry. And um, my, I hope, my goal for this talk is that um, I'll get you all the way to the end without losing you. So um, I'm actually going to, you know, do some, you know, review uh, of certain things, you know, like, you know, linear algebra and things like that. Um, and I may even, you know, quiz you because, you know, it's like a classroom, right? Anyway, so m one of my main research areas ever since my PhD has been in a covering arrays. And I want to give you an example of a covering array. So, yeah, see, this is, it's one centimeter below where I put my stylus. So this is going to be a little bit tricky now. Yeah, see? Okay, hold on. And now, of course, I have to find the button. Okay, what are we going to do here? Well, I think I'm just going to pretend I can't see it.
Oh yeah, that's working. Except I drew the wrong character. Oh boy. This may not work as well as I want it to. Okay, so I'm going to do a zero, one, 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 zero, one, 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 zero, one, 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 zero. Okay, so a covering array has a bunch of parameters. Oh, okay, that's supposed to say CA N semicolon TKV. So N is the number of rows. K is the number of columns. That's a block size parameter from design theory. V is the number of symbols, so in this case, 2. And T is called the strength. So the way a covering array works is you pick any T columns. So pick T columns, Danny. Oh, three. Three columns. Oh, no, two. Let's do two. The first and the third. Okay. So the rule in a covering array is if you pick any two columns, if t is two, you should see every ordered pair at least once. And if I pick the first and the third, and you were thinking Python, right? So you're indexing from zero? Right. Okay. So really, that's the last and the third from last. <laughs> you see 0, 0, and then 1, 1, and then a 0, 1, and a 1, 1. And indeed, that's all the, the possible pairs of symbols. Now, if you keep going, you see another 1. No, no, we saw 1, 1 twice. We do have to go all the way to the end to see the 1, 0. So that's the covering array property. It's a little bit like if you know about orthogonal arrays, but orthogonal arrays say, I want to see each of them in the same number of times. And that's not true here, right? Because I did see 1, 1 twice. I saw it in row 1, if I'm indexing from 0, and row 3. Both had 1, 1. But that's OK. For covering arrays, that's allowed. In orthogonal arrays, we want everything an equal number of times because the people who use orthogonal arrays are going to do statistics, and they're going to fit some kind of linear model. And the analysis of variance requires that you have everything an equal number of times so that you have all the statistical power. Covering arrays are used primarily by like software engineers when they're doing uh, reliability testing. So they might have some kind of um, system they're testing, and it's got four components one for each of the columns, and each component is one of two things, right? So like the, l the, l the leftmost might be operating system. So it might be like Linux and Mac. And then the next one might be which browser they're using. Zero could be Linux and Mac. So Firefox and one might be Chrome. And then they the rows are these tests. So in the first one, they're testing Linux and Firefox, and I don't know, zero is an HP printer, and the last zero, what caught, what's that one? Uh, Ethernet instead of Wi-Fi. And they run all these tests, and they see which ones fail, and which ones fail give them some idea of where the problems are. And since every pair is covered, you know that if there's an error that comes from the interaction of two things, you're going to detect it. And that's why we don't care about an equal number of times. All we need to do is make sure that we hit all these possible pairs so that if there is an error that's dependent on a pair, it shows up. OK. So I also wanted to show you a strength 3 covering array, um, but it is big. And so I've actually written it out beforehand, because since I'm using the tablet, I can do that. Um, it's the one here on the right. If you pick any three columns, and this alphabet size is now three, so this is a CA twenty-seven 
semicolon 3, four columns, alphabet size 3. You pick any three columns, you go all the way down, and you will get every ordered triple from Zmod 3 exactly once. So this is, in fact, an orthogonal array. But, man, it takes a long time to write that out. So I have this shorthand notation, okay, which is why I did this. So this here is my shorthand notation. If I take the product of these two matrices on the left, I get the matrix on the right. Now how does it, why does, how can I tell when I look at that little shorthand notation that it's going to give me a covering array? Well, I've already row reduced it, right? So I've already done the RREF hard work, and you can see I have three pivot columns, so what's the rank? Three. Excellent. Okay. And any three of those columns are actually linearly independent. Now, the matrix on the right is just a list of all three airy rows, right? So it's everything in the three-dimensional vector space over Zmod 3. And if I pick any three columns over there, they're linearly independent. They form a square invertible matrix. And a, a matrix is a map between two vector spaces. And if it's invertible, it's a bijection, right? So this is everything in a three-dimensional vector space. I put it through any three of those columns. It's a bijection. I have to get every possible triple, maybe in some totally different order, but it's all there. And I did this now because later I'm going to draw a bigger matrix, which would be huge if I had to write it out like in the right, but I'm going to write it out like that. And all we have to do is we have to look and see, oh, when are three of those columns of my short form linearly independent, and then we know once I multiply it by this thing, those three columns will have every possible row. So it's, it's a convenient shorthand notation. Okay. Yay. So I want to talk about projective and affine planes, so I'm going to review the construction of the projective plane. Okay, we're going to stick our, our like working field will be F3. So that's Zmod 3, 0, 1, and 2. Very easy. The inverse of 2 is itself. 2 times 2 is 1. Um, and addition is mod 3. And everything I do will be in that realm. But I'll state my results. They hold for any planes at all. Um, sometimes, but they, it's not every plane, but I'll tell you which, which planes it restricts to. But F3 will be our example. Okay, so we've got F3, which is 0, 1, and 2. And when we construct the projective plane, we take a vector space, which is three-dimensional. I'm going to construct a two-dimensional object, so I'm going to lose a dimension along the way. And as a vector space, that's isomorphic to the field of 27 elements, which is defined to be, well, take the polynomial ring, so it's just polynomials with coefficients at f mod 3, and then you have to mod out by something, a variable, a polynomial of degree 3, which has certain required properties, and this one has those required properties. It has to be irreducible, but it also has to be primitive. And that field consists of
everything that I can write as a linear combination of 1, that's a times 1, alpha and alpha squared, where alpha is this primitive element in the field of order 27, which means that alpha is just a root of that polynomial. And that means that alpha cubed, if that equals 0, I put the other two on the other side, alpha cubed is alpha plus 2. So there's our construction of the finite field of order 27. As a vector space, that is isomorphic to just the simple three-dimensional vector space over F3. Okay, and then I'm now constructing, I'm now going to lose my dimension, okay? This thing has 27 vectors in it, and, but it's three-dimensional because those vectors are length three. But for the projective plane, Oh. Yeah, this is going to be tricky. I'm writing everything in the wrong place. Okay, the points are, no, I have to go the 1D subspaces. So that is, take, well, 1D subspace, is got a basis of size one, so I could take um, oh. ah. oh my goodness. Okay, that's supposed to be my angle brackets for span, and that's my vector I've picked as my basis for this 1D subspace, so I'm going to get 0, 0, 0 when I multiply it by the scalar 0, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 0, 2. And I can go through all of the possible bases and generate all the possible one-dimensional subspaces. Now, each one of those spaces has three points. One of them is 0. I can't pick that as the basis. So for each one, I have two choices of the basis that will generate the same 1D subspace. So I must have 27 minus 0, because I can't pick 0 as a basis, divided by 2, because that's the repetition. There must be 13 1D subspaces. So the number, no, where did it go? The number is 13. OK. So that's the points of my projective plane are 1D subspaces. So that's where I've lost my dimension. And the blocks or the lines of my projective plane are the 2D subspaces. So I might. There I have to pick two bases. Elements and take all linear combinations. Of course, it's two dimensional over F3. I'm going to get nine points in there. OK, and we could go through a fairly complicated argument to figure out how many choices I have by trying to figure out how many possible pairs from those nine form a basis, but there's an easier way because this is really all in a 3D space, vector space, and any two-dimensional space, its perp is one-dimensional. So there's exactly the same number of 2D subspaces as 1D subspaces, yay. So that's easy to count. Okay, and this is all a kind of a you know nuts and bolts way of looking at it, and but I want to write down the properties of what we've just created. So we have um, thirteen, which is three squared plus three plus one. And in general, we always have q squared plus q plus 1 because 
the number of ways of picking a basis element is q cubed minus 1. Can't pick the 0 vector. But then I have to divide ah, by q minus 1, because that's the number of other basis vectors of 1D subspace I can pick. The properties of a projective plane are that any two points on a unique line. And any two lines intersect in a unique point. There's a third uh, axiom, which is that there exist four points, no three of which are collinear. It's a non-degeneracy. But when you construct things from these finite fields, it automatically holds. So I won't focus on it. OK, so that's all very abstract, but it relies on stuff that we all mostly probably know from undergrad classes. What does it look like? It looks like this. OK? So I have written in blue all my basis vectors that I've picked. And then I have black circles for those points, which are the 1D subspaces. And then I've joined everything up by the lines. Okay, And you see some things in here. So you notice that I've always picked my basis elements so the last entry is 0 or the last entry is a 1. I can always do that because I can always scale them if the last entry is 2. I just multiply by 2. And you see z3 cross z3 in this little grid in the lower left, and then you have, and they all have last coordinate 1. And then on the right, you have this, the points of last coordinate 0. And like geometers, they'll be like, oh, that's the line at infinity. And you're like, what? What are you talking about? Line anyway, that's the way they speak. Okay? That's the projective plane of order three because I built it from the field of order three. Okay. And now I want to define this matrix. Oh boy. OK, so this matrix, I built it from that polynomial. Remember, my elements of the, of the um, vector space were a plus b alpha plus c alpha squared. And this matrix, if I just had an a, if I had 1, 0, 0, I get 0, 1, 0. So that's the 1 multiplied by an alpha. If I just had a b, 0, 1, 0, I multiply through, I get c. I get 1 in the c position, which is alpha squared. And if I had something in the c position, that's alpha squared, I multiply by alpha. Remember, that gave me 2 plus alpha. Alpha cubed is 2 plus alpha. So this matrix multiplies by alpha. So it shows that multiplication by alpha is a linear uh, transformation. And it's invertible, this matrix. I could write down its inverse. but And we know that if I take 1, multiply by alpha, I get alpha. And then I get alpha squared. And then I'm going to get alpha cu cubed. And then alpha to the 4 and so on. And alpha was primitive, so it generates everything in the finite field of order 27 except for 0. So it's going to go all the way up to alpha to the 20, 25. And then alpha to the 26 is 1 again. And this is called the Singer cycle in the projective plane. 
that there is this linear transformation, which is just multiplication by alpha, that permutes me through everything in F27 except zero. And because I know that alpha, whoops, I want to draw that somewhere else, a little further down, alpha to the 13 squared is alpha to the 26th, which is 1. And in a field, I can have at most two elements that satisfy the polynomial x squared equals 1. So alpha to the 13 must be 2. Okay, So once I'm halfway through this cycle, it's just the first half multiplied by 2. And in the projective plane, those are the two basis elements whatever vector you want, and two times whatever vector you want. So in the plane, you really only go halfway. And then you hit another basis element that determined the same thing as that first entry in this list, or zeroth if you're indexing from zero. OK. It also cycles through all of the lines, because if Those lines are 2D subspaces. I put alpha acting on them. Well, that's the perp of some 1D subspace, which, if you do all the math, is actually you have to act S inverse on it uh, instead of S, so the S's cancel out. Um, so it, it cycles all these lines through. Um, so you've got this orbit of size 20. 6 divided by 2, which is 13 of the points, and an orbit of size 13 of all the lines. OK, so now let's take a look at one of our lines. Same one that I had before. Now, remember, this is just alpha squared, and that's just alpha, right? Because it's a1 plus b alpha plus c alpha squared. So this is just all of the things that look like um, r alpha plus t alpha squared. And if I work out if I work out what those things are, I can have alpha, I can have alpha squared, I can have alpha plus alpha squared, and I can have alpha plus 2 alpha squared. Whoop. There. And remember again, scalar multiplication doesn't change anything, so that's the same as 2 alpha, and this is the same as 2 alpha squared. And this is the same as 2 alpha plus 2 alpha squared. And this is 2, 2 alpha plus alpha squared. And I can go into that Singer cycle, all the powers of alpha, and I can find what these are. OK, so I know that alpha is equal to alpha to the 1. Alpha squared is alpha to the 2. And alpha plus alpha squared turns out to be alpha to the 10. And alpha plus 2 alpha squared, well, I want to do this one instead, turns out to be alpha to the 4. OK? So this 1D sub, this line, this 2D subspace, consists of four points. And they are alpha to the 1, alpha to the 2, alpha to the 10, and alpha to the 4. And if I write those exponents out, and these, remember how big is that cycle? It was length 13 until I got to two times my starting position, which is the same as my starting position. If I take all the differences there, 
2 minus 1 is 1. 4 minus 2 is 2. And I can take them in either order. So I'm going to say that that's plus or minus, plus or minus, plus or minus 6. And 4 and 1 is plus and minus 3. 2 and 10 is plus and minus 8. But in Z mod 13, plus and minus 8 is the same as plus and minus 5. And then 1 and 10 is plus and minus 9, which is the same as plus and minus 4. And look, I've got every non-zero element exactly once there. Right? I've got plus minus 1, plus minus 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And of course, minus 6 is 7, so I've got all the bigger ones as well. This property is the property of being a different set. It's in Zmod 13, and I can find every element, non-zero element of Zmod 13, in a unique way as a difference of two elements in there. And I can repeat exactly what I've done here for any field. And so this can be done for any projective plane. Now, if I just cycle 1, 2, 4, 10 around in Zmod 13, i.e. add 1 to it, so 2, 3, 5, 11, apply those exponents to the alpha, get my vectors back, I'll have a different line. And I'll get all the lines that way. Okay. So, I've got this nice different set. And then here's the question. I'm going to take the negatives of everything. Is that a different set? Yeah, because I just have to take my differences in the opposite order and I get everything again. So I can spin that around in Zmod 13 and look at those sets of points in the uh, in the plane. Right, so alpha to the minus 1, alpha to the minus 2, alpha to the minus 4, alpha to the minus 10. I could retranslate those into vectors. Um, and I can ask, how do those intersect the lines of my projective plane? Okay, and then my theorem is that no matter which line I take, so that's some shift of my different set, original different set. And no matter which of these other things I take, it never intersects in more than two points. Okay? So the proof of that is really, well, if, if I've shifted this, I have exactly one place with a difference of 1. If I was going to intersect D in two points that included the two that give me a difference in 1, I know exactly what the shifts x and y have to be. Because those difference of 1 have to line up. And I've got a third point, if they're intersecting in 3, that gives me some other differences. And I would do a simple count and I would find out that I could get two different differences in the original difference set that equal the each other. But I said it was unique, and that contradicts. So these minus d shifts, they're sets of points that intersect any line in no more than two places. Now, jump back to like, you know, geometry in high school. What are things? that any line intersects in at most two points. What's an example? Parabola. Can anyone think of another example? 
circle. Good. These, when you're in a projective plane, are actually all the same thing, right? A parabola is just a circle who's has an additional point off on that line of infinity. That's one of the reasons that people use projective geometry all the time, is because things simplify really easily. These are degree two sets of points that are the zeros of, or th are the degree two curve. A, that's a conic section, right? So minus d plus anything is a conic. And, but, because it's a different set, it also has all the combinatorial properties of a projective plane. So I have two projective planes on Z mod 13. If I think of D as my lines, minus D are a bunch of conics. But I could think of minus D as my lines, and D are a bunch of conics. So that's two projective planes on the same point set with this property that lines in one are conics in the other. And it's like pairs of orthogonal Latin squares. So if you have a Latin square, which is just two squares, three by three, elements, 0, 1, 2, no more, ev nothing repeats in a row or a column, and this square is said to be orthogonal to that one if when I put them on top of each other, I find every ordered pair, it's beginning to sound like orthogonal arrays, exactly once. So in the upper left, I get 0, 0. In the bottom left, I get 2, comma 1. I get every ordered pair. So because these two planes have a kind of similar property to that, I decided to try and pun on the word orthogonal, and that's why I called them orthogonal. Whether my, my co-authors will accept that in the end is yet to be seen. So I have what I call a pair of orthogonal projective planes, and that's a theorem for every prime power, Q, there exists a pair of orthogonal projective planes. And this theorem has been sort of published independently a lot of times. Brock published it in 1973, and then Glynn published it in 1978, and then Baker et al. in whoops, 1994, and with my PhD student in 2014, we published it. And I believe that these are all independent um, kind of developments of this theorem. It's a very nice theorem. Now I want to tell you why I was interested. So I'm going to take that cycle. Whoops. Oh. Whoops, alpha to the zero, alpha to, th oh, alpha to the one. Okay, I'm going to undo that. Okay. Alpha to the zero, alpha to the one, alpha squared, dot, 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 going up to alpha to the twelfth. Remember, alpha to the thirteenth is just two times alpha zero. And what are those vectors?
Well, if I write out, I figure out what all these powers of alpha are in that basis, that basis that is consists of 1 and alpha and alpha squared, I get this. Now, I liked my last coordinate to be 1, so I'm just going to erase this one, this 2, 1, 2, and it's the same 1D subspace as 1, 2, 1, and this 2, 0, 2, there. And now, I am going to do what I said before, and take that really big matrix, you know, the one that had every vector in it, and multiply. And I'm going to get something which would take me the rest of my time to write out. And how much time do I have? Okay. Okay, so, but I do this multiplication, and I want to know when I can pick three columns and find every triple, right? Well, we worked that out at the beginning of class so that we didn't have to, sorry, the lecture, so we didn't have to, you know, rework out. I just have to know when these things are linearly independent or not. So I pick three columns, and if they're linearly independent, then those three columns after I do the big multiplication will have every vector. If they're linearly dependent, so like let's find some linearly dependent ones. So I like 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and this one here, which is 1, 1, 0. I like that one. That's linearly dependent. There is a linear dependency that adds those three vectors up to zero. It's this one plus that one plus two times this one. So when I get to the row here that's one, one, two, it's going to multiply those three and give me zero. So that's why I won't get all the triples there. Okay, so what are the sets of linearly dependent vectors here. Remember, this is just all the points of my projective plane. Linearly dependent, three vectors, linearly dependent, they span a 2D subspace, so they're a line. So any three of those points which are collinear are failing to give me the coverage. But any three points which are non-collinear give me, in the end, that big matrix, everything I could possibly want. All possible three tuples. But remember what happened with minus D. Minus D could not intersect any of the shifts of D in any more than two points. So if I have three points that are linear here, collinear, they're in a shift of D, those three points cannot be in a shift of minus D. So they're non-collinear in the other plane. So I have these two planes, any three points, if they're collinear here, they're not collinear here. So I just take that other, the minus D, well, minus D just means write these in the other opposite order. So I go 2, whoops, 2, 0, 1, and I end 1, 0, 0. And now I do have to, when I'm doing this multiplication trick, I now have... six rows, so I have to duplicate over here. Whoops, no. Nope. Come on, there we go. 
I have to make a little extra room. So I just I just need two copies of all of them. I multiply this through and now I pick any three columns I want. If they're linearly independent in the first one, I'm done. Right? I don't even need to look at the next 27 rows of this multiplication. Uh, yeah. But if they were dependent up there, they're now guaranteed to be linearly independent in the second one. So they're covered in one of the two places. And so I've put these two arrays together. I've concatenated them vertically. And I'm now guaranteed to have a covering array. So these two boom, boom, boom. well, I had 27 rows in the first one, and I slapped another 27 in the second one. So I have two, and that is Q cubed. And any three columns are covered in one or the other, maybe both. I don't mind if it's both, but I don't need both. And I have q squared plus q plus 1, which for us was 13, and alphabet size q. And now if I go back a page, you know, when I multiply this 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 in here, I'm going to get a row of zeros. And when I get to the second one, I'm going to have another row of zeros. I don't need both rows of zeros. So in fact, ah, come on. I can subtract 1 here. OK. Now. If I get rid of that yellow line, oh, I get a much more comfortable object, right? That's just Z3 cross Z3. It's a nice, easy group. A colleague of mine noticed that when we multiply, I think I've drawn this wrong in any case. I think I just I needed to not do the second set over there, and just vertically concatenate h times m and then h times m prime and just stick them together. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, right. When I multiply those first three rows, the 0, 0, 1, when I multiply it in here at the top, is going to give me that l bottom row, the 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. And the 0, 0, 2 is just going to give me 2 times that. And if I could make that second array have the places in the last row where the, where the zeros are match up, then I would get, instead of being able to delete one of the zero, zero, the all zeros row, I, could, I would have these additional copies of whoops, no, Of this, that's supposed to only be highlighting the last row. <laughs> if I had multiple copies of that last row, I could delete them too. So I could, instead of subtracting 1, I could subtract Q 
Q. If I can make the places where the zeros line up. And so that's the kind of the sequel is that if you go through all of the parabolas, circles, ellipses, hyperbolas, the set of all possible conics, when you're over a field of characteristic 2, so like Z mod 2, F4, F8, so it won't work when Q is 3, you can always find, and this is the really amazing thing, you can always find a conic in this affine plane that includes 0, 0, which is the 0 of Z3 cross Z3, and is a subgroup. So for example, again, it can't work in characteristic 3, but we could pretend that it did. You might find that 0, 0, 1 and 1, 2, 1 and 2, 1, 2, 2, 1, 1 are actually a conic instead of this red line. And that can happen when your field has an even number of points. And in fact, you can find a family of Q squared plus Q of them that all that are, sorry, you can find Q plus one of them that are all subgroups and are disjoint except for the origin. So if you take all their cosets, since they're subgroups, if I have two subgroups which intersect only in one point and whose sizes multiply to Q squared, in this case, their cosets also intersect only in one point with cosets of the other. Of course, all the cosets are themselves disjoint, but that's the affine plane. I have parallel classes of lines. They don't intersect, but non-parallel lines intersect in exactly one point. If I have conics that are subgroups, the cosets are a parallel class of conics, and since the conics, the subgroups only intersect in zero, one from a, this coset and one from this coset only intersect in one. So I have an affine plane on the same point sets, but the lines here are conics here, and the lines here are conics there, and because it's the affine plane, every conic can be extended to the projective plane, they, those, the yellow line that I got rid of, they coincide. And so I can do that minus Q there, which, you know, is slightly better. The cost of that is that I don't get all of the columns I only get the Q squared that belong to the affine plane. But in any case, this is good enough that these are some of the best strength three covering rays that could possibly be constructed for the Q squared number of columns. Um, so Charlie Colburn at the University of Ar uh, Arizona State keeps a table of all covering arrays and the construction with the projective planes for the strength three covering arrays really kind of dominates the table. And he was the one who noticed if you could do this with affine planes, you could do this minus Q. It's just enough to like dominate the, the part of the table that has slightly fewer columns, which is really kind of exciting. Um, so we've been able to prove that for every field of characteristic 2, all even fields, we can construct a pair of orthogonal affine planes and then build these covering arrays. Um, so the really interesting thing is that 
some of our constructions give sets of conics which, I don't know, what's the best way to say this? Don't have an algebraic relationship. And I've been scouring the literature to find someone who's talked about these, and it seems completely new. So, you know, our motivation is this design theory thing, covering arrays. But it looks like we may have stumbled across some geometric theorems that are new. Um, and our future direction is, okay, so we constructed pairs. Can we construct like three projective planes that are orthogonal or seven affine planes? Like how many can we get? And that's like what we don't know. We have a couple of cases with computer search where we have one, we can do seven affine planes of order four. And we can do three orthogonal aff affine planes of order 32. But can we like solidify that and get more than pairs? Um, and Charlie Colburn, um, who's one of my co-authors, has pointed out that if we could do that, that would allow us to have what are called higher index covering arrays, which have every tuple appearing at least lambda times instead of at least once. And he's like, he has no systematic way of doing that in general, but they're very, very useful because they have error correcting properties. Say you run your software test and only 50% of the time are you gonna get an error when you set those two combinations together. Well, if you've got multiple times you're testing that pair, you have a better chance of uncovering the error. And so it comes right back to the application, which is really kind of cool. Um, I think I'll stop there and take questions, if there's time. OK. Um, great. Thank you very much, Brad, for your talk. Um, if anyone wanted to come down uh, <laughs> to ask a question so our, our streamers can uh, and see us, or if anyone out there in the uh, interweb wants to <laughs> contribute a question in the chat, uh, please do. Do you have any questions? But the coming down is like a little bit right? I know, right? it is. But so if, if you want to stand up can, and I hear the question, I can repeat the question. Exactly. Like we can lower the bar on, on participation. <laughs> or I can call on you, right? Like if I still think this is a problem. So, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So, like, is there a, like a smoking gun order can, is there three covering arrays of order something that's really a single exciting question that would be good to answer? Okay, so here's, here's, here's what we know so far. I've tried computer searches for projective planes. I cannot, okay, so for three, I can get four projective planes that are orthogonal of order three. This particular case, they correspond to the different sets D, minus D, twice D, and minus twice D. And they all happen to be orthogonal to each other. It's pretty amazing. I have not found any other examples where I can use D minus D, 2D minus 2D up to like a million. But, and there aren't any of order four or order five Order seven, still running. So can we prove or find some other queue where there are more than two proje orthogonal projective planes? I don't know. For the affine planes, I've got seven of order four. I've got three of order 32. We think we have some idea that we might be able to prove that three exists for some um, other powers of two, but not all powers of two. So like three or more than three of even some small um, orders would be pretty major. We think we can do four, eight, 32, and maybe two to the n where n is one or five mod six. So the next one that's not covered there is 16. We don't know how to do 16. So find three orthogonal affine planes of order 16. And boom. I mean, that, I don't know. You're not going to be famous. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
But, you know. So, Brett, um, when I'm when I'm covering uh, design theory with my with my students in combinatorics, I always tell them that you know generalizing from one to lambda is is in some senses a, a stupidly easy thing to do because you can just repeat your blocks yes. Yes. however many times. I'm yeah. guessing that, <laughs> that you do better than that with with your with what you were saying. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 I mean. I mean because this, this is a is cover, cover. It's not a, like if, it, if you're doing designs, then you want, when you ha say lambda, I want every pair to appear exactly lambda times. With these covering arrays, if I had, so the seven orthogonal affine planes of order four, I can pick my lambda to be, essentially, I can replace that two with a seven, and then I can pick my lambda anywhere from 1 up to 6. And then I have to subtract all but lambda. I can do minus, what is it, 7 minus lambda times q or something like that. I have to leave lambda of them in, those repeated rows. Um, for Charlie, this is, this is better than repeating the rows of a lambda one covering array. Most covering arrays are very ununiform in what they cover and don't cover and how many repetitions, sorry, they always cover how many repetitions, where the repetitions are. So if I took like my lambda one covering array, which was two Q cubed minus Q, and I wanted lambda and I'm gonna repeat lambda times to get that, I've got twice lambda Q cubed. But in our example, I have lambda plus one Q cubed instead of twice lambda. They're half the size of what you would do if you just repeated. So, yes. Yes, um, it's basically, it's Q plus two. Um, except when you, you, you're essentially, you're taking, if you, if you take the collection, if you had S orthogonal projective planes, if you take any three points, if they're in a line somewhere, they can't be in a conic because lines and conics only intersect in two. So if you put all your lines together, you have a strength three packing design. And those numbers are known, and it's just the Johnson bound, basically. The Johnson bound gives you a polynomial division, which gives you Q plus two, but it's not, there's a remainder, except when Q is small. So for projective planes, the ba upper bound is either five or Q plus two, whichever is larger. For affine planes, it's seven or Q plus two, whichever is larger. And we have seven uh, for Q equals four. We hit that upper bound. That's kind of interesting, right? But our three of order 32 is nowhere close to 35, 33. Um, and we have proven, so five would be the upper bound for like the, the Q equals three example that I did here we have proven that you can't have five. If you had five, you could add a point and complete it to an SQS, SQS 14, because it's Z mod 13 plus one, and we have all the 14, SQS 14s are known, and we can delete any one point in all of them and check, and none of them have that structure. So five's not possible. Four is the, is the real upper bound, and we meet it. for a little break next. If anybody has any other questions for us, they can uh, yeah, <laughs> find them over coffee. Um, so I'd like to thank, thank you again oh, for your you. talk very much. And, uh, and we'll have a little break and we'll reconvene at uh, 11.15.
Okay, thank you everyone. Welcome back. Uh, thank you for your patience as we deal with our uh, technology. Um, our next speaker this morning is Margaret Ellen Messenger from Mount Allison University who will be speaking on um, Eulerian K dominating graphs. Oh. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Uh, it's really nice to be here in person, um, far away from everyone, but, um, but, but still being able to see half the people's faces. Um, so I'm going to talk about Eulerian K-dominating graphs. Um, so I'll get to the Eulerian part in a little bit and the K part even later, uh, but first let's talk about dominating graphs. And, and what I mean by that is um, dominating uh, reconfiguration graphs. So um, a reconfiguration problem uh, involves looking at different solutions to a problem and you know you maybe have multiple solutions to a given problem and maybe some of the solutions are similar you could tweak one solution to get to another we can model this as a graph so for example on the right hand side I have something some problem with five solutions and there's some predetermined rule that tells me okay I can move from solution one to solution two following this little rule or some some tweak of the solution so you know it we could say, well, any kind of, you know, there's a lot of real world problems that could be modeled with reconfiguration graphs. And there's some robotics type applications. There's some silly ones like this little uh, tiling puzzle that some of you may remember from childhood. Uh, you could slide the tiles up and down or left and the right. And the goal was to slide things around to make a picture, in this case, a, a purple elephant. Um, so this is, this is a toy example, um, but it is an example of, of a problem you could model with a reconfiguration graph. Um, so you could think about any arrangement of the tiles, not just this this final nice one with the with the elephant in the right order, uh, but any sort of arrangement, you know, of of the tiles would be a solution. You could think about that as a solution. Any arrangement of the tiles, and then maybe you could, if we represent those solutions as vertices, then you can move from one solution to another. Well, if you slit, if you slide a tile one tile a tile up or down or left or right. Uh, as that, that, that's my movement to move between these. And of course, in, in that sort of situation, well, we want to start with some solution, some, I guess, arrangement of the tiles, and you want to find a path, maybe even a shortest path, to the actual desired solution, in this case, the, the purple elephant. Okay, so a bit of a silly example. Um, I started looking at this problem in 2019, um, but first started thinking about reconfiguration problems when I was doing eternal domination problems on graphs because we have different dominating sets and we want to move between different dominating sets. So this is the picture in my head and then, you know, a few years later I heard, you know, this was an actual thing that people studied uh, and then eventually got involved myself. Uh, so let's, let's actually start with an example. And because most of the people that work on these things are graph theorists or computer scientists that do a lot of graph theory, the actual base problems that we're looking at are graph theoretic problems. Uh, so often coloring problems, so different colorings could be solutions where two colorings, the, the nodes representing two colorings in the reconfiguration graph are adjacent. If you can just, you know, change the, the color on one vertex to go from one coloring to another. Um, or dominating sets, it, our dominating sets could be the solutions and we want to move from one dominating set to another following a rule. And the latter is what we're going to look at. So again, of course, because graph theorists looking at these problems, the, instead of looking at a real world problem, we'll just look at a graph theoretic problem and build this new graph uh, and look at its properties. Uh, so starting with a little, little example, we've got a P3. Um, so this is our little, little example. We want to look at dominating sets. So we're going to focus on, on creating this domination or dominating reconfiguration graph. So we're going to build a graph um, from this. So the dominating set, so a dominating set, remember, is a set of vertices that every vertex is either in the dominating set or adjacent to something in the dominating set. So we can think about, you know, all three vertices, uh, two of any two of the three vertices, or if we want to choose just one vertex, we're going to have to choose B because it dominates A and C. Um, okay, so those are going to be my solutions. So I've got little little bubbles representing I'm building up this reconfiguration graph. And well, how do we add in the edges? Well, the I would say the most common rule is the token addition removal uh, rule, which just says, okay, if you've got a, a node that corresponds to a particular dominating set and you can 
add or remove a vertex from that dominating set and obtain another dominating set, there's, a, there's an edge between those corresponding nodes. So it gets a little confusing talking about these things sometimes because it's, uh, am I talking about the vertices in my input graph or the reconfiguration graph? And I'm uh, probably mostly going to say vertex when I ref refer to a vertex in my input graph, like my P3. And I'll say node when I'm, I'm talking about the dominating or the reconfiguration graph to hopefully be less confusing. Um, I'll also abuse notation and terminology terribly in this talk. Um, just as a warning, I'll talk about probably talk about two dominating sets being adjacent, which is really not what's happening. It's the nodes that represent those dominating sets. Um, but I think it's I think everyone will still understand. Uh, so this is my reconfiguration graph for for P3, my dominating graph. So it's a little uh, four cycle with a leaf hanging off, and so this is how we build these reconfiguration graphs. Um, Graph theorists look at a graph, uh, you know, these, these kind of graphs and say, okay, what properties do they have? So this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, let me give you another example. If I go to P4, so I've got A, B, C, D, that's my, I'll call that my input graph. And uh, on the right, I've got my reconfiguration graph. So I've just put the actual, do you know, the vertices in the, of each dominating set in, in the bubbles. Uh, and most people look at that and they'll think, well, okay, that looks like a subgraph of a hypercube, which of course it is. Uh, or you might think of Hasse diagrams, you know, because we're looking at subsets of vertices, right? Um, but we don't have all possible subsets because not every subset is a, is a dominating set. We're missing the, the singletons and the empty set, so it's so the bottom two rows are, are cut off. So we've always got a subset of a hypercube when we're, when we're looking at uh, our, our dominating graphs, these reconfiguration graphs. Okay, so if it's a subgraph of a hypercube, it's bipartite. Um, so that's sort of one thing we can observe pretty quickly. Another observation, um, it's always going to have an odd number of vertices. So there's an unpublished result due to Brewer, Schwarba, and Shriver. Uh, it's online. They backed up three proofs of this, uh, this result uh, that the number of dominating sets in a finite graph is odd which tells us our, our reconfiguration graph, our dominating graph always has an odd number of vertices. So if we put those two facts together, we've got an odd number of vertices and it's bipartite. Um, one observation we can make is that there's this dominating graph's not going to have a Hamilton cycle. Um, we started in one partite set. A Hamilton cycle, remember, is a cycle where you pass through every vertex exactly once, a traveling salesman. Um, if we're starting in one partite set, we follow this Hamilton cycle, we would end up in the same partite set uh, because we have an odd number of vertices and so it doesn't actually work out. Uh, or you could think about how, how a three cycle would, would occur, uh, a little triangle in the dominating graph and then quickly realize that can't actually happen. Okay, so these don't have Hamilton cycles. Um, so this is sort of where I entered the problem in 20, 19 uh, in Minneapolis with a group working on um, this reconfiguration problem. We quickly s noticed, okay, there's never a Hamilton cycle, but what about a Hamilton path? And so sometimes we have Hamilton paths and sometimes we don't. So this was our, our first problem we were interested in. So I'm going to switch to numbers now. And I'm going to switch to binary, which not just to confuse you, it's easier this way uh, and more natural probably for, for a lot of people anyway. Um, so I'm going to encode things in a, a little binary string. Uh, so, you know, 1010, oh, oh, the one indicates that vertex uh, is in the dominating set, zero is, is not. So in the it's read in the order A, B, C, D. Okay, so if I look at my binary strings, uh, what I've got listed here is if I follow those um, dominating sets, so from top to bottom, uh, the nodes representing those dominating sets, that would form a Hamilton path in my reconfiguration graph, in my dominating graph. So if you look from line to line, you can see that, well, A, they actually are all dominating sets, and B, from, from line to line, I'm just flipping one digit. So I just change a zero to a one or a one to a zero. So I do have a Hamilton path. Um, and what we did was, well, we looked at Hamilton Path, and the idea was, okay, can we show that every dominating graph has a Hamilton Path when the input graph is just PN, a path? 
Um, and we can do this inductively. So let me show you how to build the Hamilton path for the dominating graph of P5. So if I add on a little vertex E, okay, so one thing I can observe is if I take every dominating set of P4 and just add E to it, I would have dominating sets of P5. Um, so I can do that. Um, but also if I take the dominating sets of P4 that ended in one, so I think that's the first six of them, those all contain D. Those dominating sets all had D, so when I add on E, well, D dominates E, so there's some more. So down at the bottom, uh, I've circled a couple of vertices, or a couple of dominating sets. Um, so if I think about these two circled ones, okay, one has A, one doesn't, but they both have B, and they both have C, and neither have D when I look at the dominating sets on P4. So I can't just, I have to add in E if I was going to take those dominating sets, but I can, I can sort of make a slight change and get some dominating sets on P5. I could, uh, what was the point of C being in there? Well, B dominated C, so I could take C out and add in E and I would get a dominating set on, on P5. Okay, so now I've got all the dominating sets on P5. It's easy to check I have them all because there's a nice inductive way to count dominating sets on paths. The number of dominating sets on Pn is just the number on Pn minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 3 added up. So I do have all the dominating sets. And, oh, no. So I had an animation, but converting it to a PDF uh, disappeared. And it's easy to see how I would actually change this into a Hamilton path, arrange these. A, into a Hamilton path on uh, for P5. Uh, P5. So the bottom two, I could just move to the bottom in the right order. And uh, appending to the top, I could take 10010 zero, zero, zero on the right, move that on top of 1011, one, one, and so on. So I can sort of like take those and flip them up uh, and take these two on the bottom and flip them down, and I would get a big long path. Okay, so we can inductively prove that um, the dominating graph of a, of a path has a Hamilton path. So I have a long list of co-authors. <laughs> uh, you'll, you'll see their names. They'll get credit at the end. I'll, I'll, just, I'll show their names then. There's a long list. Um, so that was the first thing we did, uh, which I think we did that week when we were in Minneapolis. Um, and then we thought about other um, families of graphs as well. So uh, we later proved that the reconfiguration graph or the dominating graph of any tree has a Hamilton path. So beyond paths, any tree uh, as our input graph, the dominating graph has a Hamilton path. And then cycles, too. Um, cycles <laughs> took a lot of work. Uh, so not every cycle uh, has it, the reconfiguration of a of graph of every, not every cycle has a, has a Hamilton path. Uh, so we don't win, and it's uh, congruent to 0 mod 4. This took a lot of work. Um, the way we went about it, it was, it was very long proof that, you know, even with a lot of co-authors, still took a fair bit of work to hammer out. Uh, but then we finally got it done, and of course somebody then pointed out, oh, you can do this, you basically get this result for free. Um, so if you know anything about Lucas numbers, which none of us did, um, you, you get this quite readily. So um, if we're looking at dominating sets on a cycle, if I think about in terms of you know zeros, so binary string um, is considered circularly, I have a problem if there's three zeros in a row. If I had three zeros in a row, that means the vertex that corresponds to that middle zero is not dominated, and I don't have a dominating set. So as long as I don't have three zeros in a row, uh, you know I've got my binary string. Uh, it's considered circulating, is going to be a dominating set on the cycle. Okay, so this corresponds to something called the Lucas numbers, well, the complement of the Lucas numbers. Uh, the Lucas numbers, uh, or sorry, the, the Lucas strings, I didn't need to say Lucas numbers, the Lucas strings of length n and order 3 in particular are the ones that don't have three consecutive ones. So we just looked at the complement, we want 
that we don't want three consecutive zeros, and the Lucas strings are well studied, and it is well known um, that the, the, well, the gray codes of Lucas strings are well understood. So a gray code is really just what we've been talking about. Um, so your successive bit strings differ by one digit. So, um, so we get the result basically for free if we'd known anything about Lucas strings. So it was one of those things that happens, you know, it happens to everybody, but wow, that was a lot of work for, <laughs> for nothing. Uh, but anyway, we have the result. Um, so, okay, so the point of talking about this, because I haven't said anything about Eulerian graphs, which was in my title, and the letter K was in my title, but we will get to both of those things soon. Um, so this is the first kind of stuff we did, and hopefully seeing, okay, there's a result when your input graph is a path, then a tree, then a cycle. Um, hopefully this suggests that, that the problem's hard. Um, well, we know that Hamilton is Hamilton stuff is hard in general. We all already know that. Um, and, you know, you learn in your first graph theory class that, okay, it's easy to determine if your graph's Eulerian. So let's look at the easy problem. Um, so our graph has an Eulerian circuit, remember? Uh, that's if you can visit every, you could, you can, you've got a circuit where you pass through every edge exactly once. And, well, our graph, a graph is going to be Eulerian if and only if uh, every vertex has an even degree. So it's, that's an easy problem. You just look at your graph. Is everything even? Great. It's Eulerian. So let's try the easier problem. There's, you know, seven of us working on this uh, problem of looking at Hamilton pads. It's, it's, it's slow going. So last, last summer, I worked with uh, a student, Amanda Porter, at, at, uh, for the summer. And we looked at uh, when are these dominating graphs Eulerian. So uh, as an example, here is C4 and its dominating graph. So if you look at that graph, you think, oh yeah, right, we know this the subgraphs of a, of a hypercube, and, and we really do have, in this case, everything except the bottom two rows. When we had a path, or a few of these were missing, um, but now we do have every two element subset is a dominating set. Um, so we really do have the hypercube minus, the, I think of it, the bottom two rows. Uh, no single element, dominates the graph, and of course the empty set's gone. And this is, this is Eulerian. Every vertex has degree four or two. Okay, so what's so special about a cycle? Um, nothing. <laughs> uh, it, what's special is that it's a, perf uh, a complete graph minus a perfect matching. Um, so, so that threw Amanda <laughs> initially because she thought cycles were special. Uh, but they're not. It's, it's the fact that this is a complete graph minus a perfect matching. Okay, so a complete graph has all possible edges, and if we were going to remove a perfect matching, we're removing an edge incident with every vertex. Uh, and what we get, our, our dominating graph, is going to be the, the hypercube minus those bottom two rows. Because if I remove a perfect matching, I'm removing n over two vertices, so n's got to be even. And so then no single vertex will dominate the graph, but any pair will. So every two element subset of vertices would dominate the graph. Okay, so if I've got my input graph being a complete graph minus a perfect matching, my dominating graph will be Eulerian. This is actually an if and only if. Okay, so there's the case where if G is an isolated vertex, a sort of trivial situation, but otherwise um, this is it. So the other direction is, is definitely more involved. Um, so my, here are my little pictures. He, my, my diamond is, is the hypercube, so that's sort of how I imagined like a hypercube in my head. Uh, I've drawn the whole thing, but they're not all dominating sets. The empty set scratched off. At the top, I've got the, the, s the subset that just contains the whole vertex set. Uh, I've got two possible pictures. When I, if I take a graph, and I say, okay, suppose I've got a, a dominating graph that is Eulerian. The dominating graph looks like the thing on the left or the right. Either of the situation on the left, where starting from the top, I know, okay, if I take all the vertices, that dominates the graph. If I take all the vertices except for one, assuming I don't have an isolated vertex, that will dominate the graph. So I've got this, I could work from the top down. I, I, uh, every set of cardinality you know, L dominates the graph, but then I hit this point where, oh, any set of cardinality L minus one is not gonna dominate the graph. So it's sort of like all or nothing. 
And then that right, I've got the situation where working from the top, yeah, okay, every set, uh, every set of L elements is going to dominate the graph, but then if I go to L minus one elements, some dominate the graph, some don't. So I have one of these two pictures. Um, I'll talk for a second about the picture on the left, just because I can do that quickly. <laughs> the other one is, is more involved. Um, so if we think about the picture on the left, if we're in that sort of situation, um, that, that last row of, of sets that actually are dominating sets, they're of minimum cardinality, gamma. If gamma is one, then my input graph is just a complete graph. We know that's not Eulerian. If gamma is two, then I get this complete graph minus the perfect matching. So I just need to think about the case where gamma, that minimum cardinality of a dominating set is at least three. And I can come up with a contradiction pretty quickly. So take any set S that is not a dominating set, but for which I can add any element and I do get a dominating set. So I'm right below that, um, that, that colored line. So S is not a dominating set. If I take anything that's not an S, it's going to be adjacent to everything else not an S. So my little picture down here, uh, S is my circle. It, things in S are in the circle. Everything else is in a little square. X is something down there. X has to be adjacent to everything else down there. If I take any one of those vertices and add it to S, then I, then I dominate the graph. Uh, but if I think about some vertex U in S, I take my set S and I add in X and I throw out U, it's not going to be a dominating set because it's still too small. So that tells me what's not dominated. Well, I know X is adjacent to everything down in the little in the bottom, in the little box. So if I added X to S but removed U, then U itself is not dominated. So U can't be adjacent to anything in S. It can't be adjacent to X. And X is sort of not important. Let's say we had V. U is not adjacent to anything to V either. So U is an isolated vertex. We can arrive at a contradiction in a number of ways. Um, but one way is to think about if I take my set S, I add in X and V and throw out U, I do have a dominating set because it's the right size. So how is U dominated? We, are, we, just, we just said U is not adjacent to anything. And if it's not in the dominating set, how can it be a, a dominated? So we have a contradiction. Okay, so if gamma is at least three, uh, and there's some details missing, uh, and the other case, uh, then then the the dominating graph's not Eulerian. Okay, so I've talked about let's see, I've talked about parts of my title now: this Eulerian K dominating graphs, the Eulerian part dominating graphs, but I didn't talk about K. So what is K? So just in the last sort of two minutes, um, a lot of the, w I don't know if I would say a lot or some, a, a good amount of the research that has been done on these dominating graphs has looked at restricting the size of the dominating sets under consideration. So in my picture, we don't care what the size of the dominating sets, we're just any dominating set, all of them uh, appear as nodes in our reconfiguration graph. S it's always going to be a connected graph because I could take any dominating set and just keep adding vertices until I get right to the top, and I've added all the vertices. So I have a connected graph, but if we chop off the top or the top, t some top number of rows, is the graph still connected? Well, with our very first example, P3, the answer was no, because we had a four cycle with a leaf. Um, so there's been a fair bit of work done on connectivity of these things. So this is what our K is. K tells us uh, the, s the size of the largest dominating set under consideration. So if I look at D3, D sub 3 of P4, the largest dominating set has three elements in it. So it cuts the top off. OK, well, in this case, we see, oh, we've, s we've still got an Eulerian graph. Um, great. Uh, it's actually, if I unfold that, that's just C C8. Um, but okay, now what about the graphs being Eulerian? So if K is less than the number of vertices, so for chopping off the top 
row or top s some number of rows from the top, when is the remaining graph still Eulerian? And so we only got partial answers for that. Um, for complete graphs, paths, cycles, it looks like there's more cases than there are because <laughs> there's some trivial cases in there. Uh, for cycles, it's Eulerian if and only if k is at most the ceiling of n over 3, but that's the domination number of C3, Cn. So if k is less than or equal to um, the ceiling of n over 3, then we just have the bo very bottom row. So we've cut off everything except the bottom row, and we just have a bunch of isolated vertices, and we're for what we were doing, we were saying, oh, yeah, that's sort of trivially Eulerian or not, depending on what we decide in the end, how, how we decide to call those. Um, so the only ones we found are the one I've, the, I've got a picture of, uh, but for complete graphs, paths, and cycles, otherwise, well, if you sort of, you, well, all we've got are trivial cases. If you just sort of chop off everything except that bottom, bottom row. We have some other results involving chordal graphs and, and some other um, classes of graphs that there's, um, but we don't have a full, a full answer for this. We do have some, some partial results. Uh, so that's sort of the next step is to uh, look at when these reconfiguration graphs are Eulerian, when the k-dominating graphs are, rec are are Eulerian. So dominating graphs, I, I don't know. I think is really interesting, partly because I did some eternal domination problems and sort of had these pictures in my mind from before we started working on them, so I have this other sort of motivation. Um, but I think it's, there's a lot that can be done with these problems um, in, in looking at the properties of these graphs. And so this, again, is just for our, our sort of base problem is looking at dominating sets, but you could have other problems that you consider as well. So last but not least, um, thank you for listening. And here are my actual co-authors. Uh, so there's Kira Erdesheva, Heather Blake, Smith, uh, Chastity Bozeman, Nancy Clark, who's here, Karen Seyfarth, uh, and Ruth Haas. Um, and then the Eulerian work is with uh, my student, Amanda Porter. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, um, in an effort to get us a little bit back on schedule, maybe I'll just defer questions as you can ask Margaret Ellen uh, directly over lunch, and uh, we'll uh, get our next speaker. speaker is Isaac McMullen from Dalhousie University, who will be speaking on the split reliability of graphs. Quite easy to pronounce. <laughs> hey, hi. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Do you need to adjust the mic at all? Um, okay. We're good. Great. Um, hi, everyone. I'm from Dalhousie University. I've been working uh, on a proof uh, focusing around the split reliability of graphs with Jason Brown. And I'm just here to talk about my process and, well, my progress, rather. and the proof that I, the, the proof that I ended up developing. So to start, uh, when I'm talking about mostly reliability polynomials, or a special kind of reliability polynomial, 
But in general, if we have a graph, GVE, on n vertices and m edges, I'm going to often refer to them as nm graphs, order n size m. If we associate each edge of the graph with probability p of being active, and associate each, uh, and we have all vertices always active, then we can consider the following. The k terminal reliability is the probability that we have k selected vertices and that those can communicate through operational edges, i.e., we have an induced subgraph with all the vertices with each edge p, each edge having probability p of being, act, uh, being in that induced subgraph. What's the probability that k specific vertices are connected in one component? And all terminal reliability is then the probability that all vertices can communicate through operational edges. Let me start my timer. I meant to do that. There we go. All, so that's well v of gp, gp, because in my case, k is v. It's every vertex in the graph. And two terminal reliability is the probability that two selected vertices can communicate through operational edges. In general, the way we calculate these, one of the ways we calculate these is by what I call counting operational states where you find the number of, uh, like every set of edges E, or E prime, sorry, E prime, that allow, that allow for the reliability to hold, that, rely for our, that let our K vertices connect to each other. And then you multiply those by the probability of each of those states occurring, which is P raised to the size of that set, times one minus P raised to the size of the remaining edges. So that exact, that's the probability that exactly those many edges are up. And then you add those all together for each set in, for each of your E prime. Call those counting operational states, yep. So for example, I, I said this earlier, K equals V and K equals two respond to, correspond rather, to all terminal reliability and two terminal reliability. And it's well known that this problem is sharp P complete. So it's very hard for computers to find reliability polynomials as we get graphs bigger and bigger and bigger. So for a quick example, I just have C4 up here. I'm just, for an example of showing operational states where I have A, B, C, D, and the corresponding edges, we can see that we have, C4 has four operational states when we have three edges active. We have either little a down, little b down, little c down, or little d down, or we have all the edges active. Those are the only operational states here, because if we have any fewer, we don't have the n minus one we need to make a spanning tree. And there can't be any more, because sadly there aren't any more in the graph. So for counting operational states, we have that the all terminal reliability of C4 in terms of p is p to the fourth plus four p cubed times one minus p, or negative three p to the fourth plus four p, plus four p cubed. Uh, this is the big block here, but uh, this is just the main idea. This is split reliability, which was a new idea pro uh, proposed by Jason Brown and Lucas Moll before I came to Dalhousie, and Jason introduced it to me. And it's what I wrote my master's thesis on in uh, 2021. It's the idea of, it's similar to other reliability polynomials, except in my case, we specify two vertices, S and T. I'm just gonna grab this just in case, because I'm gonna write a little bit. We have S and T, and typically we have a connected graph and we want to know the probability that every single other vertex can communicate with S or communicate with T, but not both. I.e., we want the probability that the graph is split into exactly two components. One contains, am I still on the, I went back, I'm sorry, with one containing S and the other containing T. So yeah, the induced subgraph, you want exactly two components, S in one and T in the other. So for calculating, it's useful to have uh, a way of counting operational states just like we did with other forms of reliability. And I proved this as part of my master's thesis, where if ni is the number of operational states for split reliability with the specified number of edges active, you go from i equals n minus 2 or enough to form two spanning trees, two separated spanning trees, and m minus c, where c is the smallest edge cut set that disconnects s and, that disconnects s and t. You only need to count between those ones. Everything outside of that, ni would be zero. You don't have enough, low enough, and if you have more than m minus c edges up, s and t must communicate by definition. So they're zero, and they're always positive on the inside. There's a lower bound on them. And note that if g is connected, you must have c is greater than or equal to one, but you can always do the summation between n minus two and m minus one, as long as you allow some of the ni's to be zero alongside. So it would be, positive, 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 and then after m minus c, it could just be zero, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Hmm? 
Come on. Oh, yep. And uh, if you can, if we, since we have that all terminal liability is sharp p complete, it's also easy to prove alongside that that this is also sharp p complete. This is very difficult for computers to find split reliability. So for one other quick example, the same C4 here, but I've specified A and C as my specific vertices for split reliability. It's not hard to see that C equals 2 here, right? You need, if you remove one edge, no matter what you remove, A and C can still talk to each other, so you must remove at least 2. And N minus 2 is also 2. So we just have to count the number of operational states with two edges active. And that's both communicate with A, both communicate with C, one with A, one with C, or the other way around. So we end up with the reliability being 4 times p squared times 1 minus p squared, or 4p to the 4th minus 8p cubed plus 4p squared. And we can also find split reliability for certain kinds of graphs. For example, if you're dealing with a tree, if you have uh, S, and by definition you only have one path between S and T, and other vertices going off, if we want the graph split into two components, we can only remove one edge. Remove any more, you get three components, etc., etc. So you need one vertex down, one edge down, sorry. And that edge needs to be on the path between S and T to disconnect S and T. So you can see that the split reliability of any tree is K times P raised to the N minus 2 times 1 minus P. One edge down, all other ones up. K different paths, like K different options like that, as the, it's the length of the path between S and T. Well, what if we have a, uh, and on top of that, what if we have a disconnected graph of any kind? Well, if we have, say, at least three components, S in one, T in the other, and one other one with neither of them in it, because we're only dealing with two points, then the split reliability has to be zero. Because there must be some vertex in this component that can't communicate with S or T. Or if you have two components, and S and T in the same component, same idea. In contrast, if you have, uh, the graph has, yeah, the graph has two components with S in one and T in the other, well then that's just the probability every vertex in here can communicate with S, and every vertex in here can communicate with T. And that's just all terminal reliability, what I discussed at the beginning. So that's not really interesting uh, as a new study's perspective, because all terminal reliability has been studied for much longer. So for that reason, we often restrict our studies in split reliability specifically to connected graphs. S and T in one component, you don't, you don't do disconnected, because it's either just all terminal reliability or it's zero, which is frankly easier, but that, doesn't, that makes it less interesting. Uh, we can also notice something about connected graphs when we talk about, yeah, sorry, when we talk about the plots of split reliability for connected graphs, if I just draw a quick little plot here, I have it at zero and this is at one. If we have at least, if we have at least three vertices, then the split reliability, if, if every edge is there, then it has to be zero, since S and T must be able to communicate. But if there are at least three vertices, at zero it also has to be zero, because that means that there must be some vertex that cannot communicate with S or T. Also, as stated before, we can write the polynomial like this as a sum of positive values on zero, one, where in terms of P, where it's the probability that P is present. So that means that the plot usually looks something like this. It's positive on the interval, it's 0 at 0 and 1, and just as the point with C4, there it is. So it usually goes up and then goes down. I have a theory that this, there's only one maximum on the interval, but I have not proved that yet, and I haven't gone through that yet. That's just an open question. So now moving on to actually the topic, or what I've eight minutes into this talk, to what I've actually been trying to talk about is optimal split reliability. And we say that G, with choice of vertices S and T, is an optimal graph for split reliability if it has the largest plot on 0, 1 for any value of P for any other, gra for any other NM graph. So if you have some other graph H with choices S prime and T prime for vertices, and it's same order, same size, if G is greater than, is, if, if G is greater than H, the plot of G is greater than H, the plot of H, sorry, rather, then we say that G is an optimal graph. And I'm interested in for what values of N and M these optimal, where these optimal graphs exist. It, so 
yeah, so I'm interested for what values of n and m these optimal graphs exist. This study has uh, interested people about all, to, uh, all terminal reliability and two terminal reliability for a long time. But surprisingly, split reliability turns out to be the only form for which we can determine precisely which values of n and, n and m give us an optimal graph. So I'm going to start with some early base cases. And I, I should have said at the beginning, I'm sorry, I don't count loops. I'm not doing loops when I'm counting my edges. Because loop, I'm assuming vertices can always already communicate with themselves. So loops don't add anything. So if you, I'm just going to start with some early base cases. If we have n equals 2, there's only one graph. For any value of m, it's just two vertices with constant edges between them. And that only has one plot. So that's vacuously optimal. That doesn't really, that's, that could only be the only optimal one. And if m equals n minus 1, since we're dealing with connected graphs, we're dealing with trees. So I'm saying, and for the plot of that, we know that the split reliability of the tree is k times p raised to the n minus 2 times 1 minus p, where k is the length of the path. So the only possible optimal one would be to maximize k. That's the optimal tree, where it's the single path with s and t as the endpoints. Let me see, it looks. That's the only optimal one. Yeah, in order to, yeah, we have to maximize k, so that's the only possible optimal one. So when I, so from now on, we only have to consider m greater than or equal to n and n greater than or equal to 3. But before I do, I do want to make a really useful observation about calculating optimal graphs. So it, it, as we get bigger and bigger and bigger graphs, these get harder and harder and harder to compare. So instead, I'm going to use a different way of comparing them. So say we have two graphs, g1 and g2, and we have the split reliability of both of them. And I count to m minus 1, which I'm allowed to do, as I said earlier, as long as we allow for them to be 0 after a certain point. Uh, yes, so I've calculated both of these, both sums n minus 2 to m minus 1, where n1 of i is the number of operational states for g1, and n2 is the number of operational states for g2. If we have n2 of m minus 1, that being the biggest, uh, the operational state with the highest number of edges, if that for g2 is greater than that for g1, then for suffi sufficiently close to 1, so the split reliability of g2 is going to be greater than the split reliability of g1 by taking the limit as we go towards 1. And the opposite holds for n of m n minus 2. If n2 of n minus 2 is greater than n1 of n minus 2, then for all p sufficiently close to 0, split reliability of g2 is greater than g1. So for that, I subtracted the two functions. And then I just uh, took the limit as we go to 1 from the negative direction and studied when this function was positive. So I subtracted the two. I pulled out any term that I could. And then taking the limit from the left, I pull out the uh, m minus 1 term from the summation. And then when I plug that into the limit, the top line there, or the second to the top line there, rather, goes to 0. And the third line down there, just that just uh, goes to 1. So we're left with n2 of m minus 1 minus n1 of m minus 1. Meaning that, <coughs> sorry, meaning that if n2 is f m minus 1 is greater than n1 of m minus 1, then the split reliability of g2 is better as we approach 1 from, one from the left. And the same holds for n1 of n minus 1 by taking the limit as we go towards 0. I'm not going to do that twice for you. Yeah. So with that in mind, my proposition is that the only possible optimal graph is this one right here, where we have the single path between s and t. And with all extra edges bundled between two vertices. So all these are of uh, bundle size 1, and this is m minus n plus 2. This is the only possible optimal one. That's my proposition. And it doesn't really matter where this bundle is, because in order for split reliability to hold, either all of the single edges are up, and all of these are down, or at least one of these are up, and one of these are down. Uh, if that's not the case, then split reliability can't hold, because it must be in at least three components. So the reason I claim that this is the optimal one, and see, that's the calculation right there. I, I apologize. I'm a little bit ahead of my slides, I think. Yeah. That's the split reliability calculated there. And I'm claiming that this is the only possible optimal one because it maximizes n of m minus 1 and n of n minus 2. It maximizes both of those. So it's the biggest on both sides of it, both sides of the plot. 
Hmm. So to prove that, if we let h be some other optimal graph, some other graph that we want to show is optimal, we have to show that either n of uh, n h of m minus one is uh, is less than n minus two, which is uh, yeah, it either has smaller n of m minus one or smaller n of n minus two, but that's w when comparing to g. So to do that. Uh, we assume that n h of m minus 1 is at least 1. So it only takes the removal of one edge to disconnect as disconnect u and v is what I'm going to call it for h, just to stop from confusing with, with this graph here. So if we let p, uh, sorry, u, this is my h, u v, if we let p be the length of the shortest path between u and v, then any, then any single edge that can disconnect to u and v must be on this path. It might not be all the edges on the path, but it must be some of the edges on this path. So if that length of the path k is less than, uh, is less than n minus 2, then I'm done. Because in this, I'm just going to write these here, n g of n minus 2 is equal to n is equal to n minus 2. I'm sorry, n minus 1. n minus 1 is n minus 2. The removal of any of these edges disconnects s and t. So if the length of the path is less than n minus 2, I'm done. So p equals n minus 2 or n minus 1. If it's n minus 1, if we have it be n minus 1, then we've used up all of our vertices. And all that remains to do is we can bundle the remaining edges. But if we put them on different vertices, we remove those as cut edges for split reliability. Because now removal of this edge doesn't disconnect u and v. Removal of this one doesn't disconnect u and v. So the best we can possibly do, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I'm not doing that right. There we go. That's what it's supposed to be. So. We must bundle them all on the same edge, and that just gives us the same graph as above. So if we have the length of the path between u and v is n minus 1, then the way that we make it optimal, we make it the same as our graph g. Alternatively, we could have the length of the path be n minus 2. I'm sorry. I could have drawn this better. And we have the length of this be n minus 2. So that means that we have one vertex left over. And the way that we keep the number of sing uh, the way that we keep n h of n minus I'm sorry. The way that we keep n h of m minus 1 equal to n minus 2 is we have to put that other remaining vertex off the path and put all of the bundles in there. We put the bundles anywhere else n h of m minus 1 must be less than n minus 2. And if we make the, that vertex connected to two of n points, we still lose some cut edges. So if this is the other possible graph, well, then we end up with n h of n minus 2, the other side, being smaller, being smaller by exactly 1. So this can't be the optimal graph. So our only possible opti optimal one is this one. This is our if there exists an op optimal graph for m and n, it's this one. And we note, even though this is proven for m greater than or equal to n greater than or equal to 3, our previous two cases, when n was equal to 2 and m equal to n minus 1, also fit this pattern. Single path between s and t with all bu edges bundled between two vertices. So with this in mind, I can actually disprove uh, certain values of n and m where there's an optimal graph. Because all I have to do is find one that's better at any point when compared to our g. Well, if n is greater than or equal to 4 and m is greater than or equal to n plus 1, I choose this one, where I have u and v at the endpoints. I take one of the edges off of m minus n plus 1 and put it on to another and put them between two other vertices. Doesn't matter where it is, but in that specific case, I end up, I end up with uh, it being larger as we approach 0 
as long as m minus n times n minus 3 is greater than 0, which is true since we have n is greater than or equal to 4 and m is greater than n. And just for simplicity's sake, there's my plot there of that. Uh, specifically, when n is equal to 4 and m is equal to 5. This should work for all n greater than or equal to 4 and all m greater than or equal to n plus 1. But you can see that the red plot, which is our g, which is this one still, is better on the right, but the blue one is better on the left. It's slightly better in this case. Now, I'm now, uh, sorry. All that would remain then to show is when uh, n equals 3, I haven't done anything yet, and I haven't done any other cases where n and m are equal for 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, etc., etc. If m is greater than or equal to f, if, if m is greater than n and n is greater than 4, I'm done. There's not an optimal one. The other one splits through my only possible optimal graph. What the? I'm sorry, I jumped to the end. I did not mean to do that. I don't know how I did that. Sorry. Sorry about that. So yeah, that's my only possible optimal one in this case. So I'm just going to blow through a few other cases very quickly. Uh, n equals m equals 5. Well, by checking every possible graph using technology, you find this one. Well, again, just like with my previous graph, when comparing to g and h of n minus 2, so on the left, it's equal to 8, which is greater than 7, which is the case for g. And in, instead of considering all that, we can just consider the plot, because this is a very specific case. It's very hard to see, but blue is slightly better on the left side, and red is better on the right side, just as, as I expected. Uh, for n equals m equals 6, well, we have this graph now where on the left it's 12, which is greater than 9 for, uh, for my graph G in this specific case. And again, we see that, uh, that H is better on the left and G is better on the right. Finally, for N equals, well, not finally, sorry, for N equals M greater than or equal to 7, I end up with this graph right here, with U and V at an endpoints of a path and a triangle built off of V. So we need that uh, K3 to be connected, since we need it to connect to V, all, both vertices connect to V, and I need exactly one edge down on the path between U and V. So an H, NH of N minus 2 is 3 times N minus 3, which is greater than the NG of N, NG of N minus 2, which I already showed earlier, for all N greater than equal to 7. And again, that's the plot specifically for N equals M equals 7, where we see, again, red is better on the right, but blue is better on the left side. So those are the cases where I managed to find a contradiction. And now, from here on out, I'm going to show that uh, the split reliability of the optimal graph always exists. So for 4-4 uh, four graphs, where order 4, size 4, this is the optimal one. I, I checked all the other possible graphs using maple, and this is the only possible one, where we have the path between S and T, with all extra edges bundled between those two vertices. That's the only possible optimal one. With uh, split reliability 3p to the fourth minus 8p cubed plus 5p squared. And there's the plot of it right there. So now we're left with uh, n equals 3, and we do have a problem because I didn't specify any kind of m for n equals 3. So I have to do, for all possible values of m, I have to show that my possible optimal one is optimal. So for that, I go through all kinds of, all different versions of graphs of uh, size, sorry, of order 3. So uh, the three possibilities are uh, u and v at the endpoints. So u and v are my s and t for h, remember, with a different vertex in the middle. I have the same path with uh, u on the left and v, on the, v in the middle. Or I have the triangle, where uh, all the possible bundle edges size are a, b, and m minus a minus b. So to start with uh, u and v at the endpoints, we ha need to have either w at least one of a is up and all of m minus a is down, and or at least one of m minus a is up and all of a is down. So we can see that split reliability ends up being 1 minus p to the a plus 1 minus p to the m minus a minus 2 times 1 minus p to the m. But we can see through uh, subtraction here, I'm saying that quickly because I'm running out of time, uh, through subtraction here by, yeah, by defining f as so, and then subtracting, we see that this is maximum when a is as small as possible. 
which if we could see, that's when a equals 1, and that's exactly my optimal graph. That's s t with all edges bundled here or all edges bundled on the other side. So that's the case there. That's the op my vacuously optimal one is optimal there. For u and v is in the middle, well, we can tell just by subtraction if we have g and we subtract c and we go through the subtraction, we see that that's always positive no matter what we have a as in this case. So the reliability of g is greater than that of c on the entire interval. And finally, we have the triangle where we can see, OK, we need all of those a edges to be down, because if they're up, if at least one of them is up, then u and v can communicate, and split reliability can't hold. So we have 1 minus p to the a multiplied by, well, it's the path of length 2 with u and v at the endpoints. That's the same as our original case, which we know is maximum when b equals 1. So by simplifying, we have that. We set b equal to 1 to make it bigger. We expand through that, and we find that that is biggest when a equals 0, which gives us a split reliability of g, which is then strictly greater than that of the triangle graph, and thus the optimal graph. My only possible optimal graph is optimal. So to specify, if n is greater or equal to 2 um, and m is greater or equal to n minus 1, there is an optimal nm graph if and only if n is less than or equal to 3, m is equal to n minus 1, or n equals m is equal to 4. So th those are the only possible optimal ones. All other ones, I managed to find a contradiction. Yeah, sorry, all other ones, I managed to find a contradiction. And in the remaining cases, you can check all of them and see that there is an optimal graph. So uh, thank you, and those are my sources that I used. That's all I have. <laughs> A single edge? Uh, you mean like not multigraphs, like simple yeah, graphs? Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, I haven't actually. I haven't had. Mm, I haven't actually had the chance to look at that yet. But that would be interesting if you could. Yeah. If if you didn't look at bundle edges, if there was still an optimal one, if you just looked at simple graphs, I would. Yeah, that would be something interesting to look at in the future. But no, I haven't been examining that. And any other questions? Okay. Oh, yep. Sure. I'll, even, I'll, even <laughs> I'll do the thing. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So the proofs you were talking about here uh, seem really case-based. Mm -hmm. So like I admire your persistence because that seems like a lot of work <laughs> <laughs> when, you were, when you were doing those. Um, I would have been daunted and, and yeah. given up for sure. Thank you. Do you have any hope of a proof that is kind of um, less case-based hmm. and, and more sort of an overall result? Or do you think you're, you're stuck with this I, kind of system? I will be honest with you. I may have focused too much on the time I was given. I did manage to write a proof for n equals m equals 4 that wasn't case-based. That wasn't just check every single graph and give me a, and please give me one that is optimal. That's what I did for the 5 case and the 6 case. You see, I had those graphs, and that was the better one. Uh, for the 4 case, there is uh, an actual kind of proof you can write. You can show that, OK, if I want n of uh, n minus 2, which is 2 in this case, to be big as possible, I need it to be 6, but that means that every two edges you remove disconnect S and T, and that leads to a contradiction. So that, that, that is, for that reason, yes, yes that, that is a more, more that, that is a less, less case-based case -based proof. But other than that, no, no I hadn't I really found anything. anything. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're welcome. welcome. And, and again, well done. Oh, <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. I, I, I <laughs> thank you. Well, I guess I'll thank the speaker. Um, <laughs>
start hearing that knocking, and they'll know that we're about to resume. Oh, Richard's been watching. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. yeah, we're now up to six six concurrent viewers. So somebody just signed on. Oh God, people want to call me. Oh no. <laughs> the ones who actually know what this thing brought. Yeah, I think they, they should have like prizes. A little prize for like who draws the most concurrent viewers. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the time of day might come in the yeah. Well, let's, uh, okay, so um, now if it's not showing, press make sure laptop HDMI is lit oh, on the okay. panel. Yes. Yeah, that's lit. Okay, press it again just for fun. Just in case it forgot. Okay. Is the HDMI cable plugged in? has not detected a second display. So, because oh. <coughs> it did before. Yep, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all the guys are staying. I'm the power cycle. I'm always flabbergasted when you know you walk out of a room and you eat a sandwich, and then you come back and, and it doesn't work. Things to yeah, in your front like, what did the sandwich do to this? <laughs> It's 
still wants to know what this play is.
meetup. Well, it won't connect to the internet without it. So, what time is it? Somebody. One forty-two. One forty-three. Okay. One forty-nine. I know this sound looks ridiculous, but you know, uh, this is August the seventeenth. Okay, good. And somebody said the time. It was one forty-four. One forty-four. I guess if it's there, what the hell am I doing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If it's there and it's, it's, there and it's got the data, I, I didn't know if it had the data. Okay. You can just close that browser completely. Apparently there's a problem with the drive, no? Oh, ignore that. Ignore it. <laughs> Sorry, I don't really use Windows. No, no, no. I don't know what to do. I have only Windows like to play with. Okay, so you just ignore that. And <laughs> <laughs> don't care. check is can we see the screen over there? I don't know that one yet. That's my next thing to check. Well, if we okay. can, you check just us while I point the camera at the screen. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> when I get that new, yes, we're seeing. Good. All right, so for those watching from home, I know you can hear my voice. I think we've got things Pretty open. much solved. Open. We should be able to just open it. No, it opens it in a browser. Oh! oh. Yeah. I mean, I, I could just do it. It would be fine. Yeah. Be Whatever time. you want to do. You, this is cool. We're you good. roll. You roll. Yeah, this is probably what we want. Yeah. 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 for joining us this afternoon. We're starting a little bit late due to some technical difficulties, but it is my pleasure to introduce Jen Enright, uh, who did an undergrad in computing and biology at Queen's, then oh, a uh, master's in biology in, uh, at, in Alberta in algorithmic graph theory. Uh, she now works at the University of Glasgow and spends time um, working on both infectious disease modeling and more graph theoretic, uh, theoretical graph algorithmic work. Um, Thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for uh, waiting it out, gang. The good news is, is that I had at least 15 minutes of nonsense material in this talk that I can simply skip and get us directly to a coffee break. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about are uh, multi-layer graphs uh, and eventually we're going to get to talking to cops uh, and robbers on these. Um, so uh, to, to kind of without, you know, delay, uh, the, the plan here is that I'm mostly talking about work from uh, the multi-layer algorithmics uh, team. So this is a, a project that I'm involved in uh, in the UK. It involves uh, four people directly. So there's uh, Will Peterson uh, on the on the far left, John Sylvester, uh, Kitty Meeks, my, my co-PI, and, and me. And we've been working on algorithms uh, for multi-layer graphs for a couple of years now. It's been a really weird time uh, to run a project. Uh, we, we launched the first pandemic summer. Uh, John is one of the postdocs and, and still kind of lives distantly to us. So we've, we've had a real experiment, I guess, in doing mathematics collaboratively uh, online on a real day-to-day -day basis. So the, the plan here is to talk first about uh, looking for motifs in multi-layer graphs a, a little bit. I'll tell you 
uh, what I mean by that. And this is a bit of a throwback to, I, I think actually the, the previous ECCC at which I, I, I gave a talk that included some of that material. Now, I am going to tell you, I was enormously tempted to just use the same talk because I was like, it, it was so good last time that they're willing to have me back this time. Maybe, maybe, and nobody remembers things from before the pandemic. It's like the before times, it didn't exist. But then I thought that would be a little bit rude. So I've included um, a little bit of the material there to kind of set things up. And then we're gonna get on to talking uh, about cops and robbers on multi-layer graphs, which we've been uh, thinking about for the past uh, several months. I will say that the farther we get into this talk, the farther we get into material that was done primarily by some of the postdocs and which I probably believe to be true and understood at some point, but every time I read it again, it includes methods that I don't kind of day-to-day -day use. And, and so my understanding of the results will decrease as we proceed through the talk. The good news is, is that's closer and closer to us running out of time. And so less and less likely that I'll have to actually talk about those ones. Okay, so we're gonna start off with, uh, with some of, uh, of the motivation that launched us into thinking about multi-layer algorithms, just uh, to kind of get in your head some examples that you might want to carry along with you. Um, so I, as many of you know, uh, work on infectious diseases sometimes, uh, previously all livestock diseases. For the past three years, uh, some human diseases, you might be able to guess which ones. Um, but I, I often work with these livestock networks, uh, so records of cattle or sheep moving from place to place in the UK, um, in all of Europe, we record this information. When an animal moves from one farm to another, that goes in a big database, which very gradually makes it to, to researchers who uh, calculate interventions or run models on these sorts of networks. So um, these little animals, they have these ear tags. Uh, now, increasingly, we have kind of beepable IR ear tags on these animals. Uh, and, and these all end up uh, in a database eventually. And, and out of that, because I'm a graph theorist, uh, we make a graph or a network, right? So the applied people call them networks. <laughs> traditionally, and, and, and more mathsy people call them, call them graphs. So um, the idea uh, of multi-layer networks came out of me having to make models where I often found that the kinds of contacts that I had between farms were not just different types, but like qualitatively importantly different types. So here's one example of two different kinds of layers that I might have in my overall graph of contacts between farms that are very, very different. These are trade networks of two different species of animal. So uh, over here on your left, uh, we have pigs. The pig network actually looks a bit like this. Pig, the pig industry is extremely structured in the UK. Sort of you have one place that produces pigs and then they kind of grow some pigs, make more pigs. It's a very sort of pyramidal kind of structure. So it's probably actually those legs should be shorter, uh, but it's a very structured kind of thing. Uh, in contrast, uh, cattle movements are a constantly evolving chaos. Um, and especially if you include uh, both dairy and beef industries, you just get a lot of movement all around the UK over, uh, over um, a year's time frame. Okay, so what I want to claim to you uh, without really proof apart from hand waving is that in practice the structure of this guy over here is very different from the structure of this guy over here and not only that but if we're thinking about disease control or disease transmission the way and the danger of disease transmission with pigs is very different to it uh, how it is with cattle even for a disease that's shared amongst all these species like foot and mouth disease the risk of a pig transmitting is very different to the risk of a, a cow transmitting so i want to claim that if i'm trying to model something and find some sort of optimal solution it can actually be important to me whether i'm dealing with a contact that is due to pig movement or due to cattle movement but these at least are both trade movements. Um, I also have other kinds of layers in this contact process, right? And, and many of the other ones are more geographic. So you might have seen in that previous picture, we have some really long range movements, right? We've got some cattle moving from those islands way up in the north. This is a picture of Sc mostly Scotland and a bit of England, way down into the border with England, right? So quite long range movements. Uh, whereas in contrast, things like wind patterns that can spread um, bugs or midges or mosquitoes, uh, vector borne diseases, contact between animals across field boundaries, or things like wildlife that can spread diseases. Those things are very geographically constrained, right? So you tend to end up with almost planar graphs or geometric random graphs or, or something like that. A very, very different structure to the sort of hub and spoke uh, trade system that we end up with, with those long range animal movements. And again, the risk of transmission and the interventions that I can take on that graph are very different for things that are geographic, like nose to nose fence contact versus trade, right? So I can build double fencing 
uh, that keeps animals apart from each other, there's no notion of double fencing when I'm moving some pigs across the country. But I can test the pigs when I'm moving them across the country, whereas I can't test along every fence line. Okay? So all this is is an argument that these are qualitatively different, and it's worth considering these different layers separately. Okay, so that's my pitch <laughs> from a livestock perspective of why multi-layer graphs are important. There are lots of other application arguments for this, but I, I think I'll leave them to the side for now. So this is a picture that I've stolen from a paper about multi-layer networks uh, in nature physics. The physics people were really into multi-layer networks for, for a while. They started to get bored of it, and so I thought, oh, excellent, time to write a proposal <laughs> for the maths panel about multi-layer networks. Um, but um, for anyone who is familiar with this field, what I'm talking about in this talk really is uh, this first version. So this is the same set of vertices, uh, and I have really what you could consider as edge sets. There's no notion of an edge between a vertex and itself. There's just a vertex. Um, but there are different kinds of contacts between those different vertices. So kind of think, think A, not B, not C. Edge sets, if you don't like layers. All right. So when we started working on the idea of when can knowing the different layers in our network help us algorithmically, we started off with a couple of different uh, examples, right? We were thinking, well, what does having multiple edges preserve? If I take a layer, uh, sorry, multiple layers, if I take a layer that has a nice property and a layer that has another nice property, and then I jam them together, do I get a union graph that has some other nice property, or ideally the same nice property? When does that happen? When does that not happen? So I've got some, a couple warm-up examples for that, a few immediate observations. The first here is that if we have a multi-layer graph that has a fixed constant number of layers, say four, four layers, and each layer has bounded degree, then the overall graph has bounded degree, right? Because you can't contribute, if you're adding another layer, you can't contribute more than that layer's highest degree to the degree of the union graph, right? So if your maximum degree in each of your four layers is, let's say, two, you put them all together, the biggest possible degree you could have is two times four. Um, you may have less than that because there may be some overlap. Okay, so degree kind of works. You can put layers together, and if there's a small number of layers and they each have small degree, you end up with something that still has small degree. Fine. Vertex cover number also works the same. Um, vertex cover number, I realize for anyone who isn't, uh, isn't familiar, uh, a vertex cover number is the number of vertices you need to get, not that dominate uh, the other vertices, but that cover all of the edges of the graph. So I put a little, a little example up here, right? So here's a graph, right? So here is one, let's see, here's one vertex cover, right? These two, because every edge, if I've done this right, Yes, I have, good. Uh, every edge hits uh, one of these two vertices, right? So that's a vertex cover. Uh, let me say, okay, this here, this is not a vertex cover because you see this edge here, it has no endpoints in my, in my cover. So let's, let's just erase that, okay. So vertex cover number uh, works similarly, and that's relevant for some of us who do algorithmic stuff because it's unsurprisingly very often the case that if your graph has low vertex cover number, you can solve many, many otherwise NP-hard problems because low vertex cover number graphs are just quite, all of the complicated things about them are constrained to that vertex cover because there just can't be other stuff going on really. Um, so if you take two things that both have fixed vertex cover number and you union them, union them together, um, you actually might decrease <laughs> the vertex cover number, but you can't increase it, right? So you, uh, you end up, if we have, for example, uh, I've, I've on this blue graph here, I put two stars to show you a vertex cover, um, and, uh, and in this red one here, I've got a star that covers all these red edges, and I put them together, uh, I still have, uh, the union of the vertex cover is still a vertex cover in the union of those edges. Okay, so uh, degree and vertex cover number we can just add up as a bound, uh, but this doesn't always work, unfortunately. So uh, for those who've encountered tree width before, uh, this is a, an example where it doesn't work. Um, I shall not be explaining tree width unless someone asks later, uh, but it, um, it's a very algorithmically important tool uh, that, um, that allows us to, uh, to decompose our graph into a tree-like structure and run dynamic programs that wouldn't sort of otherwise be possible on it. The important thing to note here is that trees have low tree width, therefore paths have low tree width, but grids are one of the classic examples of something that does not have low tree width. So what I've done here in this example is to take two paths, one in red and one in sort of tealish, uh, each of which has low tree width on its own, and then put them together as two layers to produce a grid. 
thus overall giving me a high tree width. So here's a, an example where uh, putting two things together, they both had nice properties on their own, but I can get a very, very, very like unboundedly different uh, answer. Uh, for this for this parameter. So I meant as we go along to be keeping a little short version of this because um, talks are always too long uh, <laughs> and too detailed. So uh, I'm just going to keep track of some of these things as we go. Uh, so short version, first point, uh, let's say uh, multi-layer graphs are cool and fun and important, but that's not important here. Uh, and the second thing is, is, the, is that uh, some layer properties uh, add up nicely, but most don't. Most not so much. And that makes our lives slightly algorithmically harder. Okay. So one of the first problems that we looked at when we started this project uh, was something called embedding. Uh, and the idea here is that you have a graph, uh, and you want to say, I'm going to take this other probably very small graph, and I want to say, how many uh, embeddings of this other small graph are there in this big graph? So for us, the, the little graph is h. It's not so little as to be constant bounded in size. That would make this uh, straightforward. Um, but we, we want to embed this, this little graph h in this big or host graph g. I'm aware that it's inconvenient that we call it the host graph, but it is not denoted by h. This was not my choice, it's convention. Um, and, uh, and we want to know how many embeddings are there of h into g. So uh, this is just a little example. If we have this host graph and we have this pattern graph, which is the thing we're embedding, uh, well, we can put it here on the left or we can put it here on the right. Uh, and we also want to count all the rotations of that if we're doing a labeled version. So one thing I want to emphasize here is that this embedding on the right here is fine, even though there's that extra diagonal edge. We're not talking about induced subgraphs here, though we actually can, and most results uh, transfer over. So this embedding question we were kind of interested in, and, and we were in particular interested in the question, well, what if we... Um, what if we're dealing with layers in which we can solve this embedding question uh, efficiently? If we put the layers together, when then can we still solve this embedding question uh, efficiently? And what we found overall is that if we're dealing with one layer uh, in which we can solve it efficiently, typically I mean in a, like a fixed parameter kind of way, um, so we can solve it in some way efficiently, but any way is fine, um, and then we combine that, so that's our special layer one, and then we combine that with lots of layers uh, on which we have bounded vertex cover number, so we have some bound on, on this number here, the number of kind of interesting vertices that hit all edges. We can add uh, sort of a, a bunch of these extra ones uh, with vertex cover number, but you know, not too, too many. Um, and as long as we're in that space, then we can still solve our problem efficiently. So um, a solvable layer plus a bunch of layers with, with this um, vertex cover constraint, that we can solve efficiently, but just not a lot else, right? Like almost every so other circumstance we came up with, uh, we, we can show that the thing is, is worse than NP hard, so like W1 hard, but with parameters, with respect to various parameters, W1, W2, I get mixed up here, very hard with respect to most parameters we're interested in, uh, which really we found a bit glum, you know? So uh, by this point, we just kind of started writing this proposal and went to launch this project, and then we finished writing this paper and went, okay, so we've just basically shown that all the things we propose to do are in fact impossible. Um, good, 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 cool, cool, cool. This is going to be a good couple of years, but luckily they don't check and take your money back. Uh, they just assume you're going to do something intelligent and interesting with it instead. And so what we chose to do with, the, with that money, among other things, is to think about cops and robbers. We thought that would be cool. Okay, so um, I, I've fallen a little bit behind, but our short version. What do we got so far? We've got multi-layer graphs are, are cool, fun, and important. We've got some layer properties add up, and most don't. We've, we've got this result about embedding. Uh, we can solve embedding uh, when, let's say we can solve embedding yes, uh, when we have, what did I say? I said one solvable layer plus fixed vertex cover and otherwise almost never. I'm being a bit imprecise there so that I don't have to kind of define lots of uh, slightly uh, arcane parameters. Okay, and that's what we found in that case. And it's gone so far as to be sort of a, 
I, I think we actually have a, a dichotomy on, on that problem. We know exactly when uh, we can solve it on these multi-layer systems and, and when we can't. Uh, and this paper has lived on the archive for quite a while and is having trouble finding another home. But we will eventually find it another home, uh, and, and that will be a fun day, and we will drink many drinks and eat much cake. Okay, so let's move on to the cops and robbers portion uh, of, of the chat. So here we're, we're once again talking about uh, a multi-layer graph. So uh, you can write it this other way. Um, you can say I have a bunch of layers. So previously I kind of had one graph and, and I kind of broke it down into layers. But now I'm talking about I have a bunch of layers, tau layers, uh, g1, g2, etc., up to g tau here. I have a bunch of layers and I put them together. And layer just means take me, you know, the, the, the layered version of all of these layers put together. Right? Uh, they, they, they don't have to be disjoint, as previously. And again, if you like edge sets, you can think edge sets here. Now, mostly what this section has in it is a bunch of kind of slightly counterintuitive examples that I thought were nevertheless sort of interesting to show you, partly because if you're interested in this kind of thing, um, it I think what it revealed to us was that things really didn't work the way we expected them to work. We sort of, when we embarked on, on thinking about this topic, we thought, okay, well, uh, we kind of know the shape of these proofs, right? We're going to try and show this, and the proof will probably look roughly like this, and we'll try and show this, and it'll look kind of like this other proof for cops and robbers. And then when we tried to actually do things, we found that often things worked n not how we expected. And so I, I thought that might be interesting to show you. Okay, so uh, we make some decisions about what multi-layer cops and robbers means because, of course, you can make lots of decisions about what it means. We, we picked one. Um, so we're going to restrict each cop to a single layer, right? So each layer uh, gets, gets um, no, let me rephrase that. It's not the case that each layer gets a cop. We might have multiple cops on the same layer. That's fine. But each cop has one layer. One layer may have zero cops. It may have five cops, but each cop has one layer. Okay, um, the... Uh, the robber, on the other hand, can use any ledge from uh, any layer, right? Um, again, this is a choice we made. We looked a little bit about situations where the robber has its own layer um, and has to restrict to that, but uh, this is the one we're talking about today. And we talk about this uh, minimum cop number. So this is kind of like the cop number, uh, the, the multi-layer cop number, right? But we call it MC. It's the minimum number of cops that need to be assigned to layers to catch the robber over all assignments of cops to, to layers. And as I say, we find some sort of counterintuitive examples. And I'm going to start with some of those. All right. So the first was a 2D square grid. We thought this will be an easy place to start. We will understand this almost immediately. And we thought what's probably going to happen here is you need at least two cops, and probably you need one to be like a horizontal cop and one to be a, a, a sorry, a one to be a horizontal cop and one to be a vertical cop. Uh, for the avoidance of doubt, what I mean by a square grid, probably everyone um, or probably lots of people know what I mean, but I mean something that looks like something that looks like this, you know, kind of going off in various directions. We're talking here about a finite version of this, so it doesn't go off infinitely in all directions, but this is, this is the shape of the thing. Okay. So two comps do suffice, but only if they are in the same layer. <laughs> if you put them in different layers, uh, they cannot catch the robber, or the robber can escape, right? You have to put them in the same layer. And this was so backwards to what we thought it was going to be. We thought for sure the result we're going to get here is that you have to have them in different layers. We're going to show that if they're in the same layer, uh, y they, they can't catch it. And, and, and really, this surprised us, right? So um, let's say, without loss of generality, we're going to have both the cops in the vertical layer, because you can, of course, just flip it and have it be horizontal. The strategy that the cops have to use, or what a strategy that the cops can use uh, to catch the robber is first, both cops move to be in the same row as the robber. So remember, they're doing vertical movements, right? So they vertically, let me be clear. So we have to, I've, I've glossed over something here, sneakily. So they, they don't get stuck in one column. Okay, so these are all vertical edges, but so is this one at the top. Okay, so we, we let vertical cops go between columns over the top. Otherwise, no, otherwise, no, 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 it, this will not work. Sorry. Um, oh, glad we got that sorted. Yes. Okay. So, so first, uh, first system is both cops move to be in the same row as the robber. So this can take them a really long time, um, but but it, it they can eventually do this, right? Uh, there are some slightly sticky arguments about kind of a co uh, the robber either ending up at the bottom of the graph uh, and you know not being, and therefore they catch up to it that way, or else it ends up in the same row as them in some other way. But the cops can eventually end up both in the same row. As the, sa as, as the robber. Then what happens, so let's say that we have 
Okay, I'm just going to draw a little bit more grid here. So let's say that our robber is a uh, spiky robber because of their evil, right? Nefarious. That's a very sneaky robber, isn't it? Can you imagine trying to be a robber if you just went around doing this all the time? Very, very stealthy. Um, so if we have our robber uh, that's, in a, that's in a row, and now uh, we have both of our cops, which I'm drawing as squares, they're both in the same row. Okay, so we've completed step one of the strategy. Step two of the strategy is that this cop here um, is going to work their way uh, around while this cop kind of guards and hangs out. So remember, this cop can't go this way. They can only go up or down. But what they're going to do is they're going to shadow the robber. If the robber goes up, they're going to go up. If the robber goes down, they're going to go down. So they're just going to stay in the same row as the robber. So they are preventing the robber from going this way. Okay. Whereas this guy here, uh, they're going to work their way. It may take a long time up and around until they're in the same row, but they're closer to the robber. So in this way, these two cops are always, one of them is always going to be in the same row. And over time, they're going to be closer and closer and closer to the robber. And because this is a finite grid, they're eventually going to run out of space. And this is how they will eventually catch them. Okay. So this is, this is how this works. And again, we really expected one of them to have to go horizontally for this to be the case, but no. We've got a, a pretty actually messy proof uh, that has many, many cases um, that, uh, I, as I've expressed before, I do not have the fortitude for. Uh, one of the clever postdocs worked out <laughs> all, the, all the many cases to show that uh, having them in the two layers doesn't work, uh, and nor does having one cop in either of the layers. Okay, so that's example number one. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll write that down, okay? Um, sometimes, and this is the point I want you to take from this example, is not specifically about the grid, but just that sometimes uh, we, need, we need cops in the same layer. And need to ignore the other layers, okay? This second example is about the fact that the, the multi-layer cop number can be, and is in this example, strictly greater than the sum of the cop numbers of the individual layers, uh, which also we weren't totally expecting. So this is an example that we sometimes call the closed line graph. You, you know the, um, those things that sit in your yard, your backyard, and they kind of wind the wire around and then you can hang your clothes, uh, rotary clothes lines. That's kind of what it looks like from above. Or sometimes uh, we call this a spider web graph, but that's sort of taken. There are a lot of graphs with spider related names. Um, so what this graph is, is it's, two, uh, it's one path, so that red thing is it's actually a spiraling path that starts at the middle and then kind of goes out and around and around and around, so it's a path. Uh, and then that, uh, that fella in the middle there in blue, that's like a, uh, a very boring long spider, so it's got one central vertex and then three paths hanging off it. And so we have a, again, mostly awful many cases argument um, that two cops are not enough, no matter how you distribute them between these two layers. Whereas if you know, we, we would expect them to be <laughs> in the individual layers. This took some doing, um, but, uh, but yeah, Will got there in the end, mostly. <laughs> so this is, this is another thing that we want to say, is that the cop number, I'm going to expand to this, I'll try not to, well, we probably people can't see that one on the camera. Why don't I move over here? So we're going with a slightly non-conventional ordering. We're going... Uh, right to left. So this is the next point, is that uh, sometimes we have a multi-layer cop number larger than some of individual layers. For those of you who are so far or so bad at reading awful writing that you can't read this, Sorry, at least it forces me to slow down a little bit so you can, so you can absorb things a little more. And we're going to revisit this kind of argument uh, very shortly when we start thinking uh, in a more formal way about the correspondence between the cop layers of the individual la uh, cop numbers of the individual layers and the, and the multi-layer cop number of the, of the whole thing. Okay, but before we get there, a little bit of complexity, uh, computational complexity, because uh, I like computational complexity and you're forced to listen to what I'm saying. Um, so uh, we, we talked about uh, a couple definitions of problems. Um, and, and so I thought I would tell you that one of them is NP-hard. This is the one that's closest to what I've been talking about so far in this, in this talk. And this is uh, given a specification of a graph and its layers. So the, the, the input is um, uh, a number of cops, a graph, and specified layers. And the question you're asking is, can you assign these cops to these layers 
in whatever way you most enjoy uh, so that you're guaranteed to catch a robber. Right? Uh, and this pro question is NP-hard, even if every single layer is a tree or a clique. Um, we were not surprised at all that it was NP-hard. We were a little bit surprised that it was NP-hard, even if every layer was a clique. That, that kind of that kind of surprised us, <laughs> um, but uh, but we got there. Uh, conversely, it's not at all surprising, uh, but if we limit things such that there's a essentially a polynomial number of game states, uh, so if you think about a game state as a uh, your multi-layer graph and a position for each of the cops and a position for your robber, if you constrain things to such a degree that there are a polynomial number of those, and you can sort of make a, 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 a game tree that is a polynomial size or a graph describing all of these states that's a polynomial size, then it will be no surprise uh, that we can answer this question efficiently because then you're just doing uh, a search on that polynomially sized uh, game tree. And this is uh, neither surprising nor original to us. Um, it's, you know, our, our description of this result is very similar to this description of a, a, a non-multilayer result um, by um, uh, Genyahan and uh, McGillivray. Yeah. So this is a different problem where we talk about uh, TK, so that's layers um, and uh, layers and cops fixed. So constant bounded number of layers, constant bounded number of cops. Uh, then we can just describe the entire thing exactly. All right. Okay. So let's get back. Oh, I suppose I better update this. Um, uh, assigning, let's say, assigning cops to layers. Is hard. So I've written NP hard here. Uh, you might have noticed I haven't written NP complete. This is because we're actually not sure if it's NP complete. So we're, we're still on the hunt for a viable certificate. This has happened to me before in this, this kind of game. Um, finding certificates for games is, is not always straightforward. So it, it may in fact not be NP complete. We might end up with some other, uh, some other hardness uh, class involved here. Okay, but let's return to discussion of this relationship between uh, the cop number uh, of the layers and the overall. Uh, multi-layer cop number. So we uh, we first uh, went on a hunt. Is there a function? Um, and th there's a little bit of mathsy looking stuff on these slides. It's actually in the usual way, uh, not that complicated <laughs> when you say it out loud. But there's some notation here. So um, if you hate notation, and and if you do, I think you might be in the wrong field. Um, then <laughs> then listen to me and and don't look at the slides. Okay. So we were we were wondering, is there um, some function f? so that our multilayer cop number of this kind of multilayer system uh, is upper bounded by, um, by some function of the cop numbers of the individual layers. That's what I mean by C of G1, the cop number of that individual layer. So is there some function, add them up, multiply them, you know, with <laughs> some function <laughs> that, that this is true? Uh, and no, there's not. So uh, uh, John has come up with a really uh, clever example um, that basically uh, using using an idea of, of taking a, a high girth expander, which has sort of special cop properties, uh, finding a high girth expander that you can decompose into uh, into two paths, which have very low cop number, of course. Um, in this way, he can show that for any constant, uh, you can produce um, these two paths and permute them with respect to each other, so sort of tangle them. That's why there's this picture of spaghetti here. So you take one of the paths and then you tangle one of the other ones with respect to it, and this will give you a layered system uh, that has, you know, um, kind of arbitrarily <laughs> a high cop number unrelated to your paths. Uh, so this was a thing that we found. No, this thing we were hoping to prove is not true. Okay, what about the other way around, right? <laughs> uh, do we have, um, you know, do we have at least that the cop number of a layered system is at least the minimum cop number. Yes, I already see some heads shaking. Well, you'd be completely right. No, <laughs> this is not. This is not true, right? So we can't bound it really from the other direction. Um, and uh, and we've got this example. Uh, it won't surprise you perhaps that this is true because you're adding edges. Um, but we've got this example where essentially you take. Uh, I'm going to wave at different parts of this. In each of your layers, you take you know one guy in the middle, hang a whole bunch of things off him, and then on the other side. Uh, what you have here is something that is sort of uh, high girth, <laughs> um, what is it, high girth, what's the degree constraint? I can't remember, but there's a, there's a nice rule that gives you these graphs over here that have, um, that have high cop number individually, and then you put these two things together, and of course once you put these two things together, um, you can just have someone uh, sit in one layer on this central vertex, and another cop sit on that central vertex in the other layer, and those two cops can see everything between them. Um, and so uh, you can do this uh, kind of no matter 
no matter how big this graph is and how complicated that graph is, uh, you can you can always cover this with just two cops. Um, so uh, so no, we can't do it in that direction either. Okay, here's another problem that we thought about as we hunted for things with interesting results. Uh, we thought, okay, what about uh, what about if uh, Chief Wiggum is is collaborating against us? Okay, so so far we've been talking about the situation where we have a graph and we have specified layers. What about if we think about the situation where we have a graph and we have a corrupt police commissioner or merely an incompetent one perhaps? And so what that co police commissioner is going to do is they're going to divide the graph into layers so that the layers are as awful as possible for, for catching the robber. Maybe they're being paid off by the mafia. We don't know, right? Okay, so this cop, uh, this uh, police commissioner, they're going to make the different layers, and then the cops, they're honest, good cops. They get to pick their layers, but they might be picking between awful layers. Okay, so we, we constrain some things. We require um, each of our layers to be spanning, by which I mean uh, it, it's uh, connected with respect to all the vertices, because otherwise you end up with just silly situations. Um, but with this constraint, uh, you still end up with. Um, you still end up with some, some funny bounds. Um, and, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the situation on cliques, uh, because uh, we start, we'll start with cliques. Uh, cliques, of course, in regular cops and robbers, uh, a, a single layer clique, easy peasy, right? A, a cop can get anywhere. Done. You don't even you don't need to compute anything. The answer is yes. The cop one cop can do it. You don't even there's no complexity there at all, right? Well, uh, so we thought we'd start thinking about the clique, and and we found that this uh, this MC tau, which is this just the name we've used for this function of like how bad can it be? How many cops can be required in the corrupt case? Uh, how many cops can be required in the corrupt case? We've got not an exact number for cliques, but we have an upper and a lower bound, uh, and I'll give you sort of qualitatively where those come from. So the, the upper bound, which is tau, which is this number of layers. So you can always do it regardless of what the layers look like by having one cop per layer, because you can, no matter how you take the edges in your clique and color them into different layers, which is that uh, colors are different layers here. Um, no matter how you do that, if you take one cop per layer and you put them all in the same vertex, well, every vertex in the clique is adjacent to that vertex in some layer because you had to put that edge in one of your layers. So you can always do it in number of layers, cops. You just put them all in the same place, plus they get to have a party, so that's nice for them. Um, and that lower bound comes from a bit of a more complicated idea, uh, and that's where we choose an edge, co edge coloring which is sort of balanced in an important way, kind of trying to divide up the clique roughly, evenly, uh, in a result from, from Sofier. Uh, and that gets us uh, a result that's actually not, of course, asymptotically any different, right? It's a uh, ceiling of the number of layers over 10. So that just gets us a kind of a, 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 con um, a constant number difference. Okay, so we know that uh, the worst case multi-layer, like the corrupt multi-layer cop number of a clique is somewhere between um, ceiling layers over 10 and number of layers, which is quite a lot of cops, really, um, I, I suppose, if you have a lot of layers. Okay. This, I think, I might whiz through quickly, but I will mention just a couple of things here. We thought a little bit about multi-layer dominating set, partly as a, really mainly as a tool to think about our cop number. Um, and what I want to emphasize here is that we, we had to come up with a sensible definition of multi-layer dominating set. Um, and, and what we came up with was that uh, each cop gets assigned to a layer, and they only get to dominate via things in that layer. So if I, if I have you know, a cop who is, oh, I've still got my grid. Convenient, no it's not. Okay, so if I've got a, a cop who's sitting here, and they're the black cop, they can only dominate these things. Even if there are edges in another layer that go say here and here, this black cop, he's in the black layer, he doesn't dominate things via red edges, even if he's at that vertex. So that's the important thing here. Our multi-layer dominating set in, in our multi-layer graph consists not just of vertices, but of vertex layer edge um, pairs, vertex layer pairs. So you might, in fact, want to use the same vertex. You might have a bunch of cops all at the same vertex, just assigned to different layers. That's the idea of the dominating number. And without going into any detail really at all, um, via some probabilistic method ma <laughs> magic, which uh, I will fully admit I don't completely understand yet. <laughs> and we're now getting into the part of the talk where it's new enough that I've only kind of read the LaTeX file. Um, 
we have this slightly messy upper bound. Uh, this uh, so kind of gamma of our layered system, this is our multi-layer uh, dominating number. So we have this multi-layer dominating number. That's the size of the smallest multi-layer dominating set. It's upper bounded by this pile of things, uh, where n is our number of vertices, Again, tau is our number of layers, uh, and this little uh, little delta, that's a degree, uh, degree related parameter. So th this is not interesting, in my opinion, in its own right, particularly, um, but we're hoping to later use it uh, to do some, some sort of future cops and robbers stuff, uh, because dominating number of this kind will upper bound the number of cops that we need on various graphs. All right. Uh, the last two things that I want to talk about, and I'll, I'll try and do them quickly, are uh, tree width and trying to come up with a Meniel's conjecture analog for the multi-layer system. Because, of course, tree width has a, a strong relationship to cop number in the, in the vanilla case. Um, and we, we think also that it does in the, um, excuse me, in the multi-layer case. So in particular, uh, what we find is that if we have a multi-layer graph, uh, if we take the tree width of the union, so the, the tree width of the squished together system, uh, then we can, we can deploy COPS using, uh, using that decomposition as well. So it's a very similar kind of flavor of thing to what you get in the, in the static case, which at least is kind of a, a positive result uh, of which we don't have a many on this front yet. So the last thing, and I'll bring it all up uh, so that I can just sort of talk about it, um, holistically, I suppose. You'll, those of you who are cops and robbers fans will know about this conjecture, right? This this uh, root n cops required conjecture. Now, I say best known bound. This was the best known to us. We are not cops and robbers people. This is what we looked up earlier this year. If I've completely got the state of the art wrong, my my sincere apologies. Please tell me. Um, we were thinking about what this might mean in a multi-layer setting because it would be good to have a similar conjecture, something to work towards, something to direct what we're thinking about. And, and we, think, uh, we think this is a sensible conjecture, right? So for some fixed number of layers uh, and, um, and each of our layers being uh, connected, we think the, uh, the multi-layer COP number of the, the layered union version of those uh, being upper bounded by n is kind of, we don't even know that that's true. We think that's kind of a sensible conjecture, particularly given the, the layer result that we have on the clique. Um, that's what we think. Uh, and then we have some uh, some kind of uh, checked on a whiteboard, but not yet checked properly results uh, relating to uh, growing graphs, where uh, if we have um, the minimum degree of the graph growing as the size of the graph grows, uh, then we we know this thing to be true. But I'll 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 leave that for now. Uh, the reason I brought up the domination number is basically just to tag it as we think that maybe uh, you know uh, th this is the approach that we're using within the proof of 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 this proposition. Um, which is, as I say, sort of, uh, I would say it's a little bit past work in progress, uh, but not quite camera ready, if I, can put it, if I can put it that way. Camera to any of you, I trust you <laughs> to not throw things at me, but uh, not quite reviewer ready just yet. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's stop there, um, getting us as, as close to back on time as I can, as I can manage. Thank you for your attention uh, through both pictures and technical bits. Um, and just to summarize, I sort of, I sort of uh, stopped talking about this when we, when we got to the later parts of the presentation, but um, that's, uh, that's okay, I can write them out if you want. Um, but what we found overall is that combining layers doesn't often preserve the structure that we would like it to preserve, that would be convenient for us if it preserved. Um, there are a few cases where it does that we can take advantage of for that motif finding application. That was that very first part of the talk. Um, and multi-layer comps and robbers has been, it's been really fun for us so far, but it's really surprised us at, at almost every turn. Uh, we have mostly negative results, but uh, hopefully, uh, uh, well, we think it's interesting and hopefully you've enjoyed it at least a, a bit. Um, if you have questions, I will, I will do my best, but as I mentioned before, the later we get in this talk, uh, the less well I understand some of the, some of the techniques, so I'll, uh, I'll do what I can. Thanks very much. Sorry, I didn't. So high girth and high cops. Let me think about that. So I think that if we have graphs, 
I was reading this this morning so that I would know it for sure, and I've already half forgotten it. Um, so probably there are people here in the audience who can help me out who are more cops and robbers people than I am, actually. Um, so graphs that have high girth uh, and, was it, low degree, those have high cop number. Is that right? No, not quite. Okay, yes, that's what we're after. Cop number, let me repeat that a bit louder just in case anyone's really keen on the video. Uh, so that's, uh, thanks so much for that. Uh, cop number five, uh, sorry, girth five means the cop number is at least the minimum degree. Yes? Okay. So, so that's where that bit um, comes from. So let me, let me just think of what that means for your question. So girth five means uh, cop number is at least minimum degree. So I suppose even in the single layer case, if we had very high minimum degree, then that gets us high cop number in that case. Uh, but that's kind of all I've got for you there. Is that helpful? Close enough? <laughs> this may be a slightly naive question, but um, so, I mean, there's a trivial bound, right? You could, you could always put a cop on every vertex on your yes, yes right? Um, so is there something sort of between Manuel's conjecture and your NP hard result mm -hmm. where you could say that Suppose I have at least this function of n cops. Okay. Then would it not be np hard anymore? Yeah. yeah. So, so maybe. maybe. So, so we, we did actually spend some time thinking about something similar similar to this. Okay. So uh, you let me just uh, repeat that back to you to make sure I have it. I have it right. So you have a graph. It has m vertices. Obviously, if we had n cops, we could just put one on every vertex. We would be done. What an amazing budget for that city's uh, police department. Let us hope they're deserving of it. Um, Okay, so I, th I think we did spend some time thinking about even if we had, you know, if we had root n cops, if we had even like half n cops, um, and didn't really get very far. I feel like there should be something in there, <laughs> right? Because all we've sort of conjectured is that you should be able to do it in less than n. Like <laughs> one less than n would be good enough at this point if we could, if we could even prove that. But I feel like that should be, that should be true. Um, I don't know. I don't know. So it's not as naive as you think it is. Uh, or at least if, if it is, I'm, I'm very naive as well. Yeah. Um, thank you.
welcome back, everybody. Um, so this afternoon, I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, Andrew Burgess from UNDSJ, uh, who will talk about equitable colorings of cycle systems. Thank you. Um, so this is uh, some joint work uh, with Francesca Merila from Rome. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, some work that we did a couple of years ago, and then at the end, I'll talk about some more recent stuff that's in progress. So before I tell you about equitable colorings of cycle systems, I want to tell you about cycle systems, and they're essentially a specific type of graph decomposition. So when I'm talking about graph decomposition, essentially what I'm looking at is taking a graph, which for my purposes is going to be almost always a complete graph or something close to it, um, and partitioning the edges into subgraphs and often of a particular type. So um, I'll refer to the subgraphs as blocks. Um, I come from a design theory background, so that's sort of uh, where that comes from. So if we partition the edges of our graph into blocks that are all isomorphic to H, then we speak of an H decomposition of our graph. So I'll start with an example here. I'm going to decompose the complete graph K7 into copies of K3, into triangles. So the first block is 0, 1, 3. And then if I just add 1 to all of the vertex labels in here, I get 1, 2, 4. And I keep doing that process over and over, working mod 7. I'm labeling my vertices with the elements of Z7. Then after. I get to seven blocks, I get to the end, 602. And if you look at that picture, you'll see um, that every edge of K7 is contained in one and exactly one of those triangles. So we've decomposed K7 into triangles. This particular decomposition is referred to as cyclic, um, formed from our base block, 0, 1, 3. And essentially, we take this base block and do this process of adding one mod seven or mod the number of vertices. And this generates our decomposition. All right, so there's you know, a lot of connections between graph decompositions and design theory. Um, if we decompose um, a complete multigraph, complete lambda fold multigraph lambda kv into copies of a complete graph on k vertices, then this is referred to as a balancing complete block design. So BIBD with parameters VK lambda. I'm not going to be talking about those too much, but they'll pop up uh, a little bit later as well. Um, so on our previous slide, our decomposition of K7 into K3s is a BIBD 731 Steiner triple system of order 7. So. The Fano plane is another way that we often visualize this. What I'm going to be talking about more is cycle systems, which are decompositions of KV into cycles of a particular length, say K. So a CK decomposition of KV is a K cycle system of order V. So another quick example, here is a four cycle decomposition of K9. This one is cyclic as well. I have this base cycle, 0, 1, 8, 3. Um, and then as I rotate that around the vertex set, I get a bunch of four cycles, again, which make up all of the edges of K9. All right, pretty uh, quick observation. If we think for a few minutes, if we want to decompose KV into cycles, well, each cycle is taking out an even number of edges at each vertex. So you're going to need that every vertex is going to have to have even degree. So V must be odd. So the sort of the common trick to extend this to even orders is to first remove a one factor or perfect matching from our complete graph before we decompose. So we're looking for a K-cycle decomposition of KV minus I, complete graph with the edges of a one factor removed, sometimes called the cocktail party graph. So here is K8. And if I remove a perfect matching, uh, this is what I'm left with, K8 minus I, which can be de decomposed into cycles, 
uh, provided other conditions hold. So here's an example of a decomposition into four cycles. Uh, so the question of when these cycle systems exist um, uh, was a long-standing question, um, and it was settled um, about 20 years ago uh, by Alsbach, Gablas, and China. Um, and Barati gave um, a, an alternative proof in the odd cycle case. Um, and essentially what this condition says is that there's a K-cycle decomposition of KV or KV minus I, provided the obvious necessary conditions hold. So we need to get the parity of V right um, in terms of whether we're dealing with KV or KV minus I. Otherwise, our cycle length has to be between three and the number of vertices. Um, and the number of edges in each cycle has to divide the total number of edges in the graph. So if these conditions are satisfied, I'll refer to V as being K admissible or just admissible. All right, so that's cycle systems. Now let's talk about colorings. So suppose I have a decomposition of a graph and I want to color it, what do I mean? Well, in this talk, I'm gonna be talking about vertex colorings. So a C coloring of my decomposition is an assignment of C colors to the vertices of the underlying graph. So more formally, I can think of it as a function from the set of vertices to my list of colors one through C. And very often, of course, we want our coloring to satisfy some nice properties. Uh, some of the common ones that get looked at are weak colorings, where you're going to require every block to have at least two vertices that are colored differently. Strong colorings where uh, blocks can't have two vertices of the same color. And in my case, I'm going to be uh, focused on equitable colorings. And here what I mean is um, if I look at any uh, two colors, say I and J, and any block, I'm going to find that the number of vertices um, colored I and color J on that block can differ by at most one. So essentially, each block sort of has an equitable distribution of the colors amongst its vertices. So I'll give you an example in a moment. Uh, I'm going to start with an example of a weak coloring. Um, so here's a, a four-cycle decomposition of K9 that I've weakly two-colored. And the vertices were colored red and blue. And if you look at it, you'll see, while well, every block contains at least one red vertex, at least one blue vertex. But this coloring is not equitable. For instance, if you look at that bottom block, 8072, you'll see, well, there's three red vertices, one blue vertex. So they differ by two. And in fact, with two colors, cycles of length four, we'd need to see two and two on each block, two red, two blue, for it to be equitable. Um, here is an equitable three coloring of that same four cycle decomposition. So I've got now red, blue, and green. And if you look at, pick your favorite block there, you'll see, look at the, you know, what vertices have which color. What you'll see is each color appears one or two times on that block. So if we look at the last block now, we've got two green, one red, one blue. So um, any two colors, the number of times they appear differs by at most one. So this is equitable. Turns out, however, that the decomposition, while it could be weakly two-colored, it can't be equitably two-colored. All right. So weak colorings of cycle systems have been quite widely, stutter, w quite widely studied. Um, we can define, for instance, the chromatic number, chi as being the least number of colors that we need in order to color the system. Um, and there are asymptotic results known um, due to Horsley and Pike, which I've written here for BIBDs and cycle systems. So they've been fairly well studied. If we look at equitable colorings, well, every equitable coloring, as long as we have at least two colors, um, it's going to be a weak coloring, but of course, not every weak coloring is equitable, as we've seen. Why might we be interested in equitable colorings? Well, here's one potential application to scheduling. So suppose we have some sort of conference or summit, and we've got V people attending representing C different countries. And they're going to take part in meetings and 
in these meetings, K people are going to meet at, at each meeting. So we're looking here for a meeting schedule so that every person attends a meeting with every per other person the same number of times. And of course, we want to make sure as well that we're spreading out representation from amongst the countries. So as much as possible, we want every meeting to have equal representation from every country that's represented. So in other words, in each meeting, the number of delegates from different countries is either equal, or if it can't be equal, differs by at most one. So essentially, a solution to this scheduling problem corresponds with an equitably C-colorable BIBD. If we want to move to cycle system land, we can think of our meetings taking place at round tables. And we want now that each delegate sits next to each other delegate the same number of times. All right. So let's uh, talk a little bit about what's known about equitable colorings. And the study of them uh, dates back to the work of these people, Adams, Bryant, Lefebvre, and Waterhouse, uh, in the early 2000s. Um, the first result, the, so the results on this slide are sort of some things we can get from doing a bit of counting. Um, the first result is sort of something that they used implicitly but uh, didn't actually explicitly state. Um, and it essentially says that if the number of colors divides the length of our cycle, um, then every cycle has to have k over c vertices of each color. That's obvious from the definition. Um, but it furthermore, the number of colors in this case must also divide the number of vertices. Um, and so there have to be, as well, um, v over c vertices of each color. Another result they got from doing some counting says, well, if the length of our cycle is one more than the number of colors, then this actually restricts what, uh, how big the cycle system can be, how big our order V can be. All right. But essentially what they looked at uh, was um, small cycle length, so cycle length four, five, and six, uh, when we have a small number of colors, two or three. So here are their main results on equitable two coloring. So um, first observation, if K is even, you can't get an equitably two colorable K, K cycle decomposition of KV. And that's coming from this fact that if K is even, uh, it's divisible by the number of colors. So we would need a number, even number of vertices. Um, for cycles of length four, five, and six, um, they showed that there's an equitably two colorable K cycle decomposition of the complete graph with the edges of the one factor removed for every admissible even V. And they also gave an existence result for equitably two colorable five cycle decompositions. They exist again for all admissible V. And they have comparable results uh, then for three colors. Uh, if we're looking at four cycles, things get restricted because of this one more uh, length of the cycle is one more than the number of colors. Um, but otherwise, for five and six, when uh, they exist is essentially when we expect they possibly could. Uh, these, um, there are some congruences on the last theorem here. This is coming from the fact that uh, if we look at six cycles with three colors, we have an extra divisibility condition coming into play. Uh, v must be a multiple of three. Just to contrast, though, um, I want to talk for a second about uh, equitab equitably colorable BIBDs. You've seen those results on equitably colored cycle systems. For the most part, they're saying when things are, when V is admissible, these things exist. For BIBDs, it's totally not the case. Uh, they were studied by Luther and Pike in 2016, and they gave conditions when you can have an equitably C colorable BIBD, and you can see they're very restrictive here. C is equal to V which is sort of trivial, or uh, you, ha you have that V is K plus one and some extra, um, extra divisibility conditions. So there does seem to be a difference here in terms of co equitably coloring 
BIBDs versus cycle systems. It seems to be a lot easier to do for with cycle systems. All right, so let me uh, talk for a few minutes then about the work that we've done. Uh, so we started looking at, well, let's look at two colors. And so, and we said, okay, let's start off with even cycle systems. They tend to be a little bit easier. And here, we're going to need to deal with a complete graph with a one factor removed. Um, we've already seen that we can't decompose KV in an equitably two colorable way um, for an even cycle length with two colors. So we're going to look at KV minus I. Um, so the result that's here on this slide is um, a reduction step, um, which essentially says, so it says if I have an even value of K and R, um, if I can equitably two-color a decomposition of K sub K plus R minus I, then I can equitably color KV minus I whenever V is R mod K. Um, so essentially what this boils down to, it tells us if we want to show existence of equitably two-colorable K cycle systems of KV minus I, then I just need to consider the case where V is between K and 2K. So this is a nice reduction step. It, it you know, takes down what we need to look at. So the idea here, um, if I have some value of V, which is uh, congruent to R mod K, I can split up the V ver vertices into you know, a bunch of Ks plus K plus R. And each of those blobs admits an equitable, equitably two-colorable cycle decomposition by assumption. Um, the edges that go between the blobs, we can decompose into things that look like a complete bipartite graph, K sub KK, or K sub K, K plus R. Um, and we showed that you can also then find an equitably colorable two-cycle decomposition of these complete bipartite graphs in a nice way that we can fill those in to get a decomposition of our whole thing. So on these blobs, essentially, we have an equal number of vertices of each of our two colors. So what we need to do for our complete bipartite graphs, we need to decompose them in such a way that our cycles are equitably colored but our parts are also equitably colored, have the same number of vertices of each color. And we were able to do that. From there, um, it's not too hard to see that there's an equitably two-colorable K-cycle decomposition of KK minus I whenever K is even. Um, just take a decomposition, color half the vertices one color, half the vertices the other. Done. We also uh, found a construction for cycle length, or sorry, uh, for order k plus two, and so this gives us um, when v is zero or two mod k. Essentially, we're done here. So uh, here's an example to show you sort of how the construction works for k, uh, k cycles in of order k plus two. Uh, we have sort of one special cycle that goes around the outside. Our vertices, k of them are in the circle around the outside, and then we have two in the center, which are going to be fixed vertices in our construction. So we have one cycle here using the edges of difference one around. And then another starter cycle or base cycle that sort of zigzags around, and then we rotate it, which uses up the rest of the edges. All right, so moving on from there, uh, we then, um, this result that we had, uh, that we had for uh, V congruent to zero or two uh, mod uh, K, this immediately gives us, um, this immediately gives us a complete existence result for odd prime powers uh, as our cycle length, or sorry, twice an odd prime power, I should say. We're dealing with even cycles. Um, and we were also able to show that if our cycle length looks like four times an odd prime power, then um, we also have an equitably two colorable cycle system whenever the order is four Q admissible. 
And essentially, that involved finding constructions for two extra orders in that case. So here's another example to give you a flavor of how that works. So here, v is 20, um, so four times an odd prime. And we have cycle length 12. So uh, in blue here, this is the one factor that I'm removing. I've colored half of the vertices red, half of them blue. And then I'm going to find um, one sort of special starter cycle that uses a few um, edge differences and rotate around. And then here is another one that, again, rotate around. All right. Odd cycles um, we're still working on. Um, we started doing that a bit more recently. We um, previously had a result for equitably two colorable three cycle systems. They exist exactly when V is three, six, or eight. So that's uh, not, too, not too interesting. Um, but once we have larger odd, or, uh, larger odd cycle length, then interesting things can happen. Um, so we have been able to give a near complete existence result for seven cycles. So there's an equitably two colorable seven cycle decomposition of KV if and only if V is seven admissible. Um, similar result for KV minus I with two possible exceptions, 28 and 30, that they probably exist, we just need to find them. Um, and we think we can generalize this to odd, odd cycles of arbitrary length, where V is 0 or 1 mod K. Um, that is work in progress. Um, it, we need to write everything up. I, I'm pretty sure it's true, but it's not written up to the point where I want to declare that a theorem. So, uh, so to come. So I want to give you an idea of how this works. The odd, odd case is a little bit different. Um, so the sort of easiest case for seven cycles is when V is 7 mod 14. The idea here is, well, V is a multiple of 7. Um, so we're going to write V is 7 times X, and X is going to be odd. So we're going to start with X vertices and look at KX, complete graph K on X vertices. We're going to decompose that into three cycles, into five cycles. And then we're going to take the points of our complete graph and blow them all up by 7. And that's going to give us 7x vertices in total. So here's a 3 cycle and a 5 cycle. And I blow them up. Well, sorry. Let me s pull them apart a little bit to make the picture nicer. So the yellow vertices here are identified. This is really a cycle. And then I blow everything up. Each vertex becomes 7 vertices. So on the copies, the seven copies of a vertex, I can think of having a copy of K7. And I can just fill those parts in by using a Hamilton cycle decomposition of K7. And what I'm going to do is color the parts so that I have four vertices of one color, three of the other. And so those cycles are good. And what I'm left with is copies of things that look like what I've drawn on this slide here. So a three cycle blown up by seven, a five cycle blown up by seven. And then what we needed to do was to find an equitably two colorable seven cycle decomposition of these graphs, which I'm not going to show you because that would be a lot of cycles to flash at you. So um, I will finish, however, with some questions that are still open. Uh, so first open problem give a complete existence result for equitably two colorable cycle systems. So we're still far from that. Our results are mostly in the cases that V is uh, 0 or K mod, K, uh, mod 2K. Um, second, determine the existence of equitably three colorable K cycle systems for K at least 7. We know they exist kind of when we expect them to, when K is four, five, or six. Um, what about larger cycles? If we have it more than three colors, still wide open. Another question, do there exist cycle systems that have a unique equitable coloring? So there's only one way of equitably coloring them, 
I don't know. Um, and there's lots of other variations of cycle system coloring and extensions of equitable, equitable colorings that could be looked at. So for example, instead of requiring the number of colors to differ by one, maybe you could let them differ by two or three among a cycle. Um, so there's other variations that could be looked at as well. So I will stop there and thank you. I'll take the compliments. <laughs> <laughs> Just in, in your previous example, you, you talked about results where you went from three cycle systems to seven cycle systems. Yep. And I was wondering about five cycle systems. So, so five, five cycle, cycle systems, systems were already, already studied, studied, so that was some oh. of the oh. results oh. of um, Waterhouse oh. and all. Okay. Thank you. Possibly. Or if they only have to be, like when you look at the, the, the colors along edges of the cycle, right. there's something equitable about just those. In some way. Yeah, like you could have, a lot, you could have many more yellow mm -hmm. than blue as long as you know, the number of yellow-blue edges was something. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that might be. Yeah, I mean, we haven't looked at that type of that yet. Like somehow incorporating the structure of the cycle into the coloring. Yeah. That might be interesting. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And just so you know, uh, stream watcher Saleh Al Hakim uh, sent applause oh. on the stream. <laughs> Thank you.
our next speaker is Anders Hornick from um, Memorial University of Newfoundland, who will be talking about the Watchman's Block, a directed, directed circulants, and three regular heliographs. Thank you. Thank you. Right, and of course, this is a joint work with Jared Howell and Danny Dyer. And so the Watchman's Walk problem on some graph, which was first proposed by Hartnell et al. in 1998, is the problem of finding a minimum closed dominating walk on a graph. So uh, it's usually presented as a guard in a museum, and the, ra the graph represents the sort of rooms of our museum. You want the shortest path that the guard can walk around such that he sees every adjacent room at least once. Uh, so this here is, uh, as we call the graph gamma, it is a closed and dominating walk on gamma, but it's not of minimum length. So in fact, this would be an example of a watchman's walk. I say a watchman's walk because they're not always unique uh, on this graph. Uh, we call the length of this walk the watchman number and denote it w of gamma. In this case, w of gamma is 2. Uh, it's defined pretty well the same on directed graphs with movement and the domination happening sort of in the direction of the arcs. Uh, in this case, w of gamma equals 4. You can notice that it is a distinct, like the, the watchman number does change sometimes quite a bit when we add direction to these graphs. And in fact, even if the graph is connected, we don't have a uh, watchman's walk in every case on directed graphs. Um, this one here is because it has a sort of source vertex on the right. If you see that right-hand vertex, uh, you can never dominate it unless you're standing on it. And if you stand on it, as soon as you leave that vertex, you can never come back. Um, however, there is a certain class of digraphs that always have a watchman's walk, uh, thanks to Dyer, Howell, and Pittman. We know that any strongly connected directed graph has a watchman's walk. Move on to the idea of Cayley graphs. A Cayley graph, gamma of G and S, is a graph generated by a group G and a generating set S of G. Uh, it has to be a generating set because, well, for it to be connected. Uh, there's a vertex for each element in the group, and for every element in the group and element in the set, uh, there's a directed edge from that vertex to the vertex GS. Uh, there are alternate definitions. Some people define it slightly differently, but this is the one that is best for my purposes today. And we have circulant graphs that are a special type of Cayley graph, uh, where a group is a finite cyclic group, in our case, we use the cyclic group Zn under addition. Uh, there are n vertices, and each vertex has an arc from vertex k to vertex k plus si for every si and s. Uh, a more concrete example, since it's a bit of an abstract definition, uh, we write it as circ n semicolon s, where n is the number of vertices and s is the connecting set. Uh, on the left, we see uh, the circulant with seven vertices and the connecting set two, three. And on the right, we similarly see ten with the connecting set one, four. Uh, so you'll notice on the left, like every vertex ha is connected to the one, two in front of it and three in front of it, and similarly on the right with one and four. Uh, if S is its own inverse, so in this case its own negative, we see the circulant as an undirected graph. So here, plus or minus two, plus or minus three, uh, we just change all the arcs into undirected edges. And thankfully, we know exactly when uh, these directed graphs have a watchman's walk because of this theorem here. Um, a circulant is strongly connected, and it's, it's always strongly connected. It'll never just be weakly connected. It'll be strongly connected if and only if n and every element in our set uh, they don't all have a factor in common, so the GCD of all of them ends up being 1. Now we move on with the directed circulants with two elements in our set S. Uh, in order to understand the watchman's walk, we need to understand the sort of uh, structure of walks in general and how they work on our graphs. Our first important theorem is if we want to have a closed walk of length L on a circulant with, specifically right now we're talking about our set being 1 and k 
for some k between 1 and n, uh, exclusive. Uh, a closed walk of length L exists if and only if this congruence here has a solution for B that's between 0 and L. Uh, so in this case, it actually gives us not only the fact that a walk exists, but it gives us the structure of that walk. Um, B ends up being the number of moves along these arcs of length K, and you end up, all the rest of the moves, of course, are along those arcs of length 1 around the perimeter of the graph, like we saw with 10, 1, 4. And so this kind of lets us know when a closed walk exists and when it doesn't of certain lengths on these graphs. And it just comes from the fact that um, if we let A be the number of moves along arcs of length 1 and B be the number of moves along arcs of length k, in order to get back to where we started, uh, the total sort of number of vertices we travel has to be a multiple of n. And, of course, if we want the length of our walk to be L, A plus B equals L, and just some simple addition, simple subtraction, winds you with that uh, formula back there. It also gives us a very useful corollary, which just comes from basic facts about solving modular congruences. Uh, if we have some circulant where S is 1 comma K, uh, the GCD of N and K minus 1 has to divide the Watchman number. So it has to divide the length of any closed walk, and thus it has to divide the watchman's number where it's the length of a minimum closed dominating walk. The next thing we need is the ability to put some sort of bound on our watchman number. Uh, the most obvious one just comes from looking at the out degree of the graph, uh, where we have that every vertex is only sort of dominating two other vertices at a time, uh, by a simple counting argument, we can show that any circulant with two members in S, uh, uh, the length of our watchman's walk needs to be at least the ceiling of n over 2. We can't do it in less because we sort of don't see enough vertices on our walk. Clearly for these graphs, we can always do a closed dominating walk in n moves. We can kind of just walk around the perimeter of the graph since every vertex is connected to the one in front of it. Uh, however, there are two sort of special walks we can always do that are closed and dominating and often end up being better and sometimes optimal. So now we're actually going to see some Watchman's walks here. Um, these walks, the first one is better for smaller k, so when k is less than n over 2, k being the length of our other jump, so it sort of winds us onto the right-hand side of this graph. We start at 0. These graphs are vertex transitive, so it really doesn't matter. Just for convenience, we'll start at 0 and the green vertices are the ones being dominated. So here, standing at 0, we dominate these three. Then what we do is we step forward uh, k minus 2 times by 1, and then jump forward by k. And what you'll notice is we sort of dominate every vertex along the way. We sort of, there's none left to go back and pick up. We've dominated everything up to 7. We repeat this as many times as we can without coming back to the start, well, without passing the start. And then we just sort of walk around the perimeter of the graph again. And this gives us a very nice upper bound. Um, if we let r be the remainder of n divided by 2k minus 2, then we have the Watchman number being less than or equal to n plus r over 2. Uh, this actually is optimal in a few cases. It's optimal when r equals 0, because it hits a lower bound. And it's obvious for other reasons when r equals... Uh, k plus 1. This is the walk for when we have larger k, if k is bigger than half of n. Um, we're going to let k prime be n minus k, so going forward by k, you can see is kind of going back by k prime. So in this case, instead of going forward by 16, you can see it is going back by 3. So we're going to similarly uh, step by k prime, then step back by 1. We're going to take two more steps by k prime here, and you'll notice that, again, just like the first walk, we've dominated everything along the way. We repeat it a couple of times again, and this one's slightly more complicated at the end because you can't just walk around the rim and pick everything up. You have to sort of... Uh, go to the end, double back and collect the ones you've missed, and then go back to the beginning. 
which means the length of this walk is not, there's no nice, simple, closed form. It depends on your n and k. In fact, this table here shows all the possible lengths of this walk. Uh, if we let r prime be the remainder of n divided by 2k prime plus 2, uh, depending on what r prime is, we have a different length of our walk, so a different upper bound for the watchman number. And in fact, there are two cases when this walk is optimal as well, uh, when r prime equals 0 or r prime equals k prime plus 1. Just highlighted in blue there. So there are a lot of special cases, in fact, that we can just solve immediately, uh, be it because our lower bound hits our upper bound or because there's some... Uh, one of our previous theorems sort of eliminates all other possibilities, and we can easily tell what the lowest uh, length of a dominating closed walk is. Uh, here, instead of putting the numbers, I've just sort of highlighted what the optimal cases are. So if we have n down the side, k across the top, the uh, cells highlighted in green are ones that we can sort of solve immediately. We know exactly what the watchman number is just based off of what n and k are. Uh, so if k equals 2, k equals 3, k is half of n, k is 1 or 2 less than n, the GCD of n and k equals 2, uh, k minus 1 divides n, k minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod n, n minus k plus 1 divides n, uh, all of these families are sort of immediately solvable, and here's all of them put together. Um, of course, I'm just showing up to n equals 20, but these go on. They just get a little more sparse as we move out. Uh, but all of the green cells here are ones that are sort of immediately solvable just by looking at n and k. Don't even have to draw the graph, no calculation necessary. It's just we know the watchman number here. Um, we can also solve these by looking at isomorphisms because of the following theorem and its corollary. Uh, Adam in 1967 mentioned that if you have some mu, some integer mu that's co-prime to n, uh, you can multiply everything in your set S by mu, and you will get a, a graph that's isomorphic to your original. And obviously then we can take our graphs and just start multiplying them and get new ones, but this is important because on the bottom you can see if n and k are co-prime, then k has a multiplicative inverse mod n, and 1 comma k case is isomorphic to the 1 comma k inverse case, where k inverse is the multiplicative inverse of k mod n, of course. So you end up getting just a lot of graphs for free when you can solve other ones. And here's a sort of example of what it would look like for us to solve one of these. Uh, we will start with uh, 16, 1 comma 7. I'm just realizing I don't actually have a picture of the graph down, but we can, uh, we can imagine. Um, we plug in our bounds, and we see that w has to be between 8 and 10. Uh, so we want to see if there's a closed dominating walk of length 8. We just sort of start from the lowest possible number, and we work our way up. Uh, we solve our congruence that we saw earlier, and we get b equals 4 or b equals 12. So if we want a closed walk on this graph, we have to either have 4 moves by uh, 7 or 12, and obviously 12 is too big. So we take these numbers and we plug them into a Python program that I wrote that painstakingly checks every walk with four moves, like with, you know, any amount of moves by one and any amount of moves by k, checks every walk and sees if any of them are dominating on our graph, and we see that it is not. So we move on and try 9, but w can't be 9 because uh, the GCD of 16 and 6, which is n and k minus 1, is 2, so it has to be divisible by 2, and 9 is not. And so we hit our upper bound, so w is 10. So far we have the watchman's walk number for every n and k up to 45, 1, 25, at which point uh, Google Colab ran out of RAM, which is an easily solvable problem by not using Google Colab, but we haven't gotten there yet. Um, <laughs> this is the first, this is up to n equals 20, because 45 was just way too messy. But all of those blue cells up there are ones where we hit our lower bound, uh, so they're the ones where the graph is easily solvable in the ceiling of n over 2 uh, moves. 
Uh, so now if we move on to the case where instead of forcing one of them to be 1, we have j comma k, uh, just any set of size 2. Uh, but we see, unfortunately, most of the graphs are sort of not interesting. Many of the graphs are either disconnected because of the GCD problem we have earlier, or they're isomorphic to some graph of the form 1 comma k, because we can just multiply one of them by their inverses. Uh, so the only graphs that are connected and can't be reduced to a 1 comma k1 are ones where n and j have a common factor, n and k have a common factor, but j and k do not. Um, thankfully, there are a lot of parallels between j, k, and 1, k. There's a lot of things that generalize up. Uh, so in the more general case, GCD of n and k minus j divides w, or divides the length of a closed walk, just like before, uh, with, n minus, with k minus 1. And we have a bunch of infinite families that are also solvable in the jk case, which is nice. So every n that we have solved up to n equals 45, we have also solved it not only for 1 comma k, but also for uh, any j and k are all solved as well. So every possible circulant with s size 2 up to n equals 44 is solved. And, of course, there's no real nice way to represent that because it's all in a, a text file that's way too long to scroll down through. And now we move on to something sort of different altogether. Um, our three regular abelian Cayley graphs. So, in 1995, Xu classified all of the three regular Cayley graphs of an abelian group. Uh, he showed that all of the graphs are isomorphic to one of four families of graphs, which are the following. Is isomorphic to either Q3, the cube graph, K4, the complete graph on four vertices, uh, Ym, the prism on 2m vertices. So here we see uh, Y5, 6, and 7. There's sort of two 5, 6, and 7 cycles. Uh, each of the corresponding vertices are connected to each other. And a similar yet very distinct graph, Mn, the Mobius ladder on n vertices. So this is M10, 12, and 14. You'll see it's it looks broadly the same, except for that one little cross, uh, which is why it's called the Mobius ladder. It looks like a ladder where you twist the ends and connect them. So we just solved the Watchman number on these graphs. Thankfully, our lower bound of the ceiling of n over 2, but I don't write the ceiling because all these graphs have an even number of vertices, uh, still works for these graphs, as long as there's no dominating vertex or dominating edge in the graph. So we can easily see that the Watchman num number of the cube graph is 4. Uh, K4 is an even simpler one because it's each of the vertices are dominating. So you just stand on 1, and your Watchman number ends up being 0. Uh, YM follows the lower bound as well. But things sort of get interesting at the Mobius ladder. Um, turns out there's no closed dominating walk in n over 2 vertices, but it can, or sorry, n over 2 moves, but it can always be done in n over 2 plus 1. You sort of have to account for that bend when you're coming back around. Uh, this is easier to see when you look at this representation, so surprisingly enough, uh, this graph is isomorphic to this graph right here. This is our undirected circulant uh, plus or minus 1 and over 2. And you'll sort of see here, this just kind of, it makes more sense here. It just sort of looks more like this is the best you can do uh, in n over 2 plus 1. And in fact, it is. Um, and yeah, this gives us the following theorem. So just after going through and solving each of those, uh, if G is an abelian group and you make a three regular Cayley graph of that group, if it's on n vertices, the Watchman number is either 0, n over 2, or n over 2 plus 1. So what haven't we done? So uh, it might be interesting to see if there are any other families of circulants that can be solved easily right away, like in our graph or our table with all the green cells before. Uh, we sort of gave up looking for families after a while because we had a way to computationally solve the rest of them. So, you know, there, there wasn't too much of a point in keeping looking. 
what changes when the size of our set is greater than two? It seems fairly obvious that the Watchmen number will get lower, uh, but maybe there will end up being more families to solve, and maybe there will end up being uh, a lot more interesting patterns when you have this sort of more connected circulant. Uh, what about four regular graphs? So in the same uh, technical report where Hugh classified these three regular graphs, he also classified the four regular graphs, but they unfortunately weren't classified as concretely. Uh, the three regular graphs were sort of shown to be isomorphic to these very easy to see, very concrete, like already known classes of graphs. Uh, the four regular ones the classification was a lot more abstract, like they were shown to be isomorphic to each other, but there was no easy way to picture the graphs themselves. Uh, maybe there is if you have more background than me in group theory, which is none. <laughs> um, so for regular graphs, there might be something interesting as well. And what can be said about non-abelian Cayley graphs? Is there a similar classification, or is there at least one that would help us to solve this problem in a much more like broad strokes way? Thank you very much for listening, and of course, thank you to NSERC for the funding. <laughs>
probably already there waiting. <laughs> okay, our, our last speaker of today is Jared Howell from Grenfell Campus and Memorial University, um, who will talk about the Watchman's Walk problem on graph products. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I'll start with a couple of apologies. Um, First of all, I apologize for however my mustache and beard looks because I've been wearing a mask. Uh, second, I will apologize uh, because this is the same talk that I gave at CMS. Um, and so if you've already seen it, uh, you know, don't pay attention, leave. Pay attention again, it's up to you. Uh, I'll also apologize because it's also on the Watchman's Walk problem and uh, well, Anders just went through a lot of the stuff, uh, at least the background, but I'm gonna quickly go through it again in case anybody else showed up online. Okay, so. Uh, this is the Watchman's Walk problem on graph products. Um, there's really, uh, and this is joint work with Danny and uh, Brittany Pittman. Um, and so the first part is going to be stuff from a paper that Danny and I wrote uh, a few years ago that's finally published. And uh, the last part of the talk is going to be stuff that uh, Danny and Brittany and I worked on uh, after she had kind of done everything for her uh, master's thesis and we were looking for something else to, to look at. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, this is kind of it. The first three sections there are the stuff that Danny and I looked at first. Okay, um, so we have a graph. Great, everybody knows that. Uh, I'm going to talk about connected graphs here. Um, and so the Watchman's Walk problem is just a variation of the domination problem. And so um, hopefully uh, after the few talks today, we all know what a dominating set is. Um, Minimum dominating set here denoted by gamma, and those are called gamma sets. Uh, so, as an example, quickly, you know, that forms a dominating set in this graph. Right? So pink vertices there. All right. So, if we imagine this graph as a building, um, and some kind of, of, of map here, and the, the vertices are rooms, the edges between the vertices are essentially doors between rooms. Um, a dominating set is then just a set of rooms uh, from which every room can be seen. Okay, so if you, you know, put somebody in each of those rooms, they could see what's going on by looking through the, the doors to the next rooms. Um, so instead of having multiple people standing on a vertex looking around, what happens if we just have one watchman, all right? So one person who's going to walk around and try to see all those rooms. Um, and so the idea is we want to be able to do this over and over again. Um, and so it's going to be uh, closed and we want it to be shortest. Um, we just want to be uh, adjacent to each room. We don't need to go into each room. And so we get a minimum closed dominating walk. And that's what we're, we're going to be looking for. Um, and so a watchman's walk here. Um, if I start at one, go to five, go to three, back to five, back to one, um, that is a uh, watchman's walk here of length four. Um, watchman's walk's not unique in this graph. I could have went one, two, three, five, one. That would have worked as well. Um, and so really uh, what we're trying to do is, is usually just find out what W of G is. So what's the watchman's walk number on a graph? All right. Um, just more notation for talking about neighborhoods, um, open and closed neighborhoods. Hopefully most people know what that is. Um, we kind of have this neighborhood bound, okay? Um, and so the idea here is, um, you know, as we kind of um, walk around this graph, we are going to pick up um, rooms that you can see. That's the way I kind of think about it. So I'm on a vertex, I can see the neighbors, I have to walk to one of those neighbors, then I can see its neighbors, and so on, and you keep going. Um, you know, but if I walk from one vertex to another one, then somehow I've double dominated that vertex that I walked to, because I saw it from where I was, and then I walked to it, and now, oh, well, I'm dominating it again because I'm standing on it. But not only that, those two vertices could have had a neighbor in common, and I've now seen that one twice. And so um, we kind of, you know, think about walking around here, and, and there's some kind of repetition in the domination, and that kind of forms, I want to say an error, but it's not really an error, it just makes W larger than you, than it could possibly be. 
right? So we kind of have minimum bounds here that we can get from these things. Um, and so uh, this, is, this is one of them. Uh, so the, the watchman's walk is bigger than n over delta minus 1, um, where delta is the maximum degree. OK, um, so I want to talk about products. Um, so uh, when I'm talking about products, uh, I'll talk about the Cartesian product here first. And so this is just the definition, but it's probably best done with an example, which I've drawn here. So if you want to take the Cartesian product of these two graphs, um, everything kind of just, I want to say, becomes squares, essentially. So uh, if we look at, you know, over here on the right, um, the, the, the pink vertex that's in the second graph, right, now becomes essentially a pink copy of the, the first graph there. And similarly, you can look at it in the other direction. If you look at one here, right, and you look at all the ones over there, they're just a, 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 a colored copy of that, that one, right? So, or sorry, of the, all the ones <laughs> have the, the colors of the, the second graph. Okay, um, and so if you put the neighborhood bound on this, um, we get a, a lower bound here. And uh, the, you know, that's just plugging in the values. Um, and so I'm going to talk specifically about a couple of common grids. And, uh, you know, it, it's nice uh, for these. So if we take paths or, um, or cycles, uh, we're going to get basically mn over 3 for both of those as the, the minimum values. All right. Um, so let's talk about constructive upper bounds. Um, this is messy looking, so I'm just going to wave my hands about. <laughs> um, so when we do um, constructive bounds, what we're really saying is, well, if I want to know there's a watchman's walk, I could essentially just walk around the graph the best I can. And if I get back to where I started, then I've created a closed dominating walk. And so that is an upper bound on what the minimum closed walk is going to be. And so this is just a way to walk around essentially a product, get back where I started, um, in some, well, I want to say a messy way, but really uh, don't worry too much about it, but the idea is that I'm going to find dominating sets in one of those graphs, and then I'm going to walk through that thing and kind of pick up everything as I go, and then I kind of get back, and I'll do that again. And depending on like parities and stuff, I can, I can save myself a, a little bit here and there, so that's why there's this parity term on the end. But that's the idea, is just find a way to walk through these products. And that's what we've, we've done there. Um, and so here, here's an example, pretty, pretty easy one. Um, I have G and H. This one actually meets the bound. Um, we know it meets the bound because uh, we can kind of just, we can argue it from the, the properties of these two graphs. Um, so essentially, you, um, if, if you try to, you know, change this and you try to try to move around somehow into a different ver into a different copy, um, you're not going to be able to dominate in, in, in that number of steps. So I've drawn it here. So here's the graph. And if you kind of just walk around one of these and get back to the beginning, um, you'll dominate as you go. Well, hopefully that's pretty obvious there. Um, so Cartesian products of paths. So if we're just talking about paths, um, if one of them is short, when I say short, well, between one and six, um, we, can, we can say exactly what the answer is. Um, if it's larger than six, <laughs> um, we kind of have an upper bound here. Um, and it, it's kind of messy, but uh, basically it happens kind of mod six and uh, those are the, the values over there. Um, essentially, this just finds a nice way to walk it. And um, the, uh, all these things over here, are, again, are based mod 6. And so when we walk around, we get some savings, you know, um, if, if it's 0. But other than that, we're, we're adding on this extra factor of uh, essentially 2m here. Uh, similarly with cycles, uh, it's just a different function up there, that's all. So, uh, again, just an upper bound. Um, 
we're fairly confident <laughs> uh, that the watchmans walk uh, in the toroidal grid. So if we just have uh, cycles, um, if one of them is six n, so um, a multiple of six, uh, we can just walk it like this, kind of over and over again. So this is this is a toroidal grid. So this goes around this way, and around this way, um, and so this is supposed to be kind of you know continuous as we walk all the way around there, come in here, down back over that way here down and then you'll come into another copy of it which looks like that and you can just kind of keep doing that over and over again um, and so you'll notice here kind of I don't have a, I don't have a pointer <laughs> but uh, you know if you look at these these corners let's say like where, where we turn in the walk every time we have to turn we get these extra dominations that I was talking about, right? The, these, these repetitions in our domination. So if you look at kind of uh, one, two, three, four, five vertices in there, I think it is six vertices in, uh, that vertex is dominated both by the one to the right of it and the one below it, right? So as I make a turn, um, you know, I'm going to get kind of extra domination. And the same thing kind of happens there in the middle of these two. And like, you know, so every time we kind of turn and have to move, we get some extra domination. Um, and essentially, that's why we don't meet, let's say, a counting bound. So one where we're talking about, um, you know, just just that neighborhood kind of property, right? Because we do get these these extra things in here. Um, we don't think we can do better than that. We think this is kind of like the minimum number of turns, uh, but we never we never manage to hammer out a proof. Um, okay, so let's go and, and talk about strong products now. Uh, so song strong products now, um, essentially we just, you know, it's now not all squared, it's an X. So you can think about that. Um, again, we can uh, create an upper bound uh, by walking around, you know, uh, this product kind of, you know, same kind of way. You're going to do this, you're going to come down, uh, walk back, you know, kind of get around the graph in some way. Um, and so we can actually find and proof that some of these are, are um, you know, exactly correct. <laughs> uh, and that's that second part there. So if M and N are relatively prime, then the strong product of two uh, multiples of five there, uh, cycles, um, that's exactly uh, five MN. Um, so that was the stuff that Danny and I had done in our paper from a few years ago. Uh, and then Brittany did her thesis, uh, you know, and we started looking at directed uh, graphs. And so, essentially, uh, you know, as Anders said in the last talk, um, it basically kind of works the same way. Just movement and domination have to go in the direction of the arc. So whatever way it's pointing, you can see that way, you can walk that way, but you can't go backwards along it, okay? Um, that says, uh, and again, the, the, the fundamental difference between digraphs and graphs, of course, is that um, it doesn't necessarily even have a watchman's walk on a digraph. Like, you just might not be able to do it. Um, so, for example, if you have a source, you can't leave that source and then get back, and you can't dominate the source unless you're on the source. Okay, um, so we're going to talk about directed Cartesian products here. Um, so we're dominating it like, uh, sorry, we're, we're done. Uh, we are denoting it like uh, CM box CN with the arrows over the, the C's there. Um, and so we, what's, what's some of the first kind of things uh, we can think about? Now, this is a, this is a directed product. So I'm just going to kind of think about, let me draw this here. So I, I've got a product and you can kind of think about, this is a cycle, right? So these are going to go this way. These are going to go this way and they're going to show up here like this, okay? So it kind of just goes around and around, uh, you know, and this is just like a kind of a square grid. So we're looking at that. Um, so what does this say? Well, this basically comes from the fact that, uh, you know, if we want to get back where we started, you know, we have to keep going in the direction. So, um, you know, if you go in the, let's say the M direction, well, however many steps you're kind of going around, right? And however kind of steps you're going in the other direction, you got to get back where you started. And so this is just going to be a linear combination of um, 
M's and N's, right? So depending on how many times you kind of go around each loop. Um, so this thing here has, you know, degree four, um, and this is going to be our, our minimum bound because as we walk around, that's what we're going to see essentially, right? So that's kind of that, just that neighborhood idea. Um, if they're both odd, we have to tack on this other little bit here. We get this GCD kind of requirement, um, just saying that we, we can't do it unless, uh, unless we, you know, take a few extra steps. All right. Um, so how are we going to solve some of these things? Well, um, one thing that we talked about was, well, you think about, you know, walking around this thing. Could we kind of contract two of these, say, columns together? You can do it with the rows, too, if you want. Um, but really, the idea is, you know, if I have a walk, and so let's say I, I move along, you know, a couple of the edges, you know, between these these two columns. Well, if I kind of merge those two columns into one, well, I'm, I can take away two steps because those edges aren't there anymore, but it's not going to change the domination, right? Everything is still dominating here. So I've just made my walk shorter. And so that's the idea here is I can just kind of take those away. Um, and the other thing we kind of looked at on how to build these things was kind of like a tiling theorem. So if I have a really nice way to you know, do one of these, well, somehow I can kind of cut it and like put another one in there, but only in, in, in certain uh, cases. So there's a GCD restriction here, um, you know, in there. But that's the idea is that I'm kind of going to, even though this is a, a, you know, it's a toroidal grid, kind of think about just cutting it and putting it together kind of as you see it on the screen, like I could tile this piece of it, you know, here, 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 maybe that kind of thing. All right. Um, so I'm going to do some examples, <laughs> uh, just kind of show you how to get, you know, some of these answers. Uh, so if I have C7, C10, uh, the answer is 37. So why is that the answer? Um, well, I don't know. It's the answer because you know, that's the answer. So what's the minimum that could be? Well, it could be 35, right? Because uh, it could be MN over 2. Right? Um, and you notice all those green dots there? Those are all where the double dominations kind of take place. Okay? Um, so why is it 37? Well, um, it has to be a linear combination of 7 and 10. It can't be 35. That would be all 7s. I've got to have at least, I got to at least go once in the 10 direction. Otherwise, I'm just going to be stuck kind of in the same place the whole time, right? So I'd just be stuck like over here doing, doing loops. Um, and so I end up going three in the 10 direction, one in the seven direction. That's how many loops I've done here, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and that's, you can see where the, where the arrows, the orange arrows kind of go. Um, and so you can check uh, 36 is not linear combination, so it's not that number. So 37 is, the, is the, the least I can do. But notice that there are four extra dominations. Those four extra dominations lead to two extra steps. So you can think about it that way. Um, so 37, uh, that's the best you can do. That's, that's an example of it there. Um, C7, C9 is 34. And in fact, this is just a contraction of this C10. So yeah, which one did I contract? I think just the first two columns there of C10. I've, I've contracted those together. And when I contract them, you notice that there's three like orange edges in there. As I contract those three orange edges, I'm still going to keep all the dominations and I end up with 34. And you can uh, check that, that that's, that's the best. <laughs> um, C7 and C8, that one is 29. It is not a contraction. Um, essentially, you know, uh, 7 times 8 over 2 is 28. It can't be 28. Um, and so I'm going to get this uh, just uh, two sets of dominations here, but notice this time I'm now going three loops in the seven direction and one in the in the eight direction. Okay. Um, and now if I do seven times seven, well, that's uh, 
that's going to be 28. Again, it's going to be one more than I, one more than the minimum, one more than n over two anyway. And uh, here you'll notice that, um, again, I'm, I'm doing the same kind of walk I was doing uh, in C7 and C8, but this time because there was only one loop in the eight direction, when I contracted, which I contracted the last two, I think, so you contract the last two there, um, I'm, I'm still going to get, I, I'm only going to reduce it by one this time, even though I contracted, you know, the same way I did on the, on, in the previous one, because there were th the loops going in that direction, there were more of them. Uh, I ended up reducing it by three last time, and so here it's just by one. Um, Hang on, let me just, uh, let me go back for a second. So, um, one thing I, I wanted to point out, if I'm trying to, you know, walk around, uh, you know, this, this grid, if I wanted something to be, let's say, two by two, so I want, you know, somewhere I'm going to loop twice in each direction like that that's kind of the idea I want here right so I'm going to go you know, twice in, in in one direction twice in the other direction when I'm doing my loops if I do that um, I can't do that without without crossing stuff and make it one walk right so you know kind of go all right well I gotta go there and now this comes over here okay and so you know where's where's this gonna go well this one's the one that's gonna have to go there if I don't want it to cross you know, come out here, back there, down here. Oh, look. You see how these walks are now disjoint, or are now are two separate walks? So like this one and this one are, are a walk, and then this one and this one are a walk. And so if I have, you know, two here and two here like that, no, it, that's no good. And so I have to cross. And when I have to cross, well, that's gonna give me um, just extra dominations, right? Because anytime I, I want to, you know, cross two things, when I cross, you know, I'm kind of, coming say down one and across the other or maybe they're meeting at the same point but as I do this there are lots of extra dominations around here right so these things are all going to be dominated more than once um, and so we get some we get some some extra error in there when we do that okay um, so again much like like Anders threw up on the on the on the screen there it was uh, you know I, I got this uh, Cn by Cn up to C10 by C10 here, um, and, and we've got a giant table. This keeps on going, um, and I've all these are the actual numbers, and we've got them in a bunch of different ways from from our theorems and bounds and stuff. Uh, the green ones there meet the the mn over two bound, and the pink ones meet um, the mn uh, plus the GCD over two bound, and that's it. Thank you. diagraph it makes sense for domination to have to follow the direction because that's all the direction could mean yep. Yep. but in this case of a walk walk lens walk it seems like there would be there could be some really nice intermediate uh, directions where you allow the domination to go either way but your path has to follow the direction so you know the traffic has to has to move in the direction but you can still see through that door over there. right right, right. Um, yeah, yeah, we haven't, we haven't, we haven't looked, looked at, at that, that really. really. I mean, we, we kind of just said, well, this is a, you know, let's say a, a locked door with a, with a, you know, a one-way mirror. You, just, like, you can look through or you can walk through. That's it. Um, but no, we haven't really uh, kind of you know, mix and match those either way. Like, you can walk one way or you can see one way. Or, no, we haven't really uh, changed that. <laughs> of course, that's not <laughs> wrong. Okay, so you know the answer when it's undirected, or okay, you, you said you think you know the answer when it's undirected cycles yeah, yeah, yeah. where one was divisible by six, mm -hmm. right? Very nice pattern. Mm -hmm. And 
And you have the directed case, which is more difficult. How many and which edges could you make undirected to get the same number that you had in the undirected cycle case? I mean, I'm not expecting you to know the answer. Yeah. Do um, you have a sense? Do I have a, have a sense? sense? Like, are there critical places? I don't know. Okay. I mean, I mean we, have we have these, these, these turns, turns where that kind of double, double domination takes place. place. Yeah. And, I mean, it, depending on, like, if you were going to give a nice pattern to this, it, you could make it so those things were, say, just dominated from one of the things that dominate them. So, like, if you made some of those one-way edges, like just arcs, I mean, that kind of thing could probably yeah, save some stuff, but I, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. But you, sure. had, you didn't have double domination <laughs> even in your supposed undirected. Mm -hmm. Like, the, you couldn't avoid the double domination entirely. Well, you might be able to avoid the double domination if you put those edges the correct way. Oh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Uh, I've never met you, nor have I heard of this <laughs> Watchman's Block before, but um, have you ever looked into a, um, the product of a path and a cycle, like those sort of extended yep. prisms? Sure, sure. So, so the, the, the problem with a product of a path and something, and something if you were doing it directed, directed, is that you can't get back to the beginning of the path, right? Um, uh, but, but did we do that with um, undirected? Uh, I think we looked at it briefly. Um, but I don't think we actually like wrote down anything. We kind of like it ended up being just like kind of some combination of the two, if I remember correctly, um, just with a, a kind of a nice way out of the path, <laughs> uh, rather than having to like kind of go back over stuff that you've already seen. You can just kind of loop around. But it, you know, it is like you'd think. It's somewhere between the two. Thank you. And just once again, we'll let you know, uh, Saleh Al Hakim sent his applause. Thank you. <laughs> He's, he's the only one that's uh, <laughs> sending that. Uh, Sorry, loyal fan. <laughs> stream now. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're on the stream now, you can take note of that for tomorrow's talks. So I guess otherwise we will sign up to go streaming.